Uh, now, I don't have any, but eventually I'm going to resume. All right, if everybody could uh, could congregate here, Regents and uh, otherwise, my uh, my atomic clock says it's 1.30, so this is, uh, we're going to, uh, I'm going to call to order the uh, meeting of the Mission Fulfillment Committee of the University's Board of Regents, uh, June 13th, 2019, and uh, we'll start. Uh, we with uh, in recognizing uh, Austin Kraft, our student representative from the Twin Cities campus, and Mason Mason Schlieff, our student representative from Rochester. Welcome to both of you. Yours. And I'm going to turn this right over to our provost for an introduction to a topic that I'm quite confident this will generate lots of interest in discussion: system undergraduate enrollment uh, issues and updates. So, Provost Hanson. Thank you, Chair McMillan, and members of the committee. Uh, as you recall, there were campus enrollment presentations from Duluth in December 2018, Rochester in February 2019. Those presentations were part of a series that began the previous academic year when colleagues from Crookston and Morris presented information about their enrollment management activities. In February of this year, you also received an update on the Twin Cities enrollment plan, which you've heard annually since approving that plan in 2016. In March, you received campus-specific enrollment plans from Crookston, Duluth, Morris, and Rochester campuses, and you approved those plans in May. As each of the campus presentations has emphasized, recruitment and enrollment have to be managed carefully at the campus level and we have appropriate admissions um, staffing and resources on each campus to do this in recent years however we've given more concerted attention to complementing the campus level work with system level collaboration and strategy this involves a culture change and new ways of thinking and working together at the heart of the culture change is an allegiance to the idea that we're one university and it is to each campus's benefit for there to be a healthy enrollment on every other University of Minnesota campus. Today, we continue the conversation about managing university enrollment as a system. We now have a system enrollment council, which brings together on a regular basis the campus admissions directors, vice chancellors, and the vice provost in order to advance this work. But it's important to note that the campus chancellors are deeply engaged in this um, conversation as well. So they're here today, along with the vice provost, to lead the presentation. Um, uh, and that's one sign of the way in which this has vital importance to all of us. So in alphabetical order, we have Chancellor Baer, Chancellor Black, Chancellor Carroll, Chancellor Holtzclaw, and Vice Provost and Dean of Undergraduate Education, McMaster. And I understand that Chancellor Carroll is going to lead off. Welcome, chancellors and uh, vice provost. Uh, Very on. Chair McMillan, Regents, Provost Hansen, thank you for your interest in our system enrollment management activities and future plans. It's an exciting topic. The recruitment and enrollment of University of Minnesota students is of utmost importance to our collective future as an institution and a state. When we recruit undergraduates, we're discovering human potential and then connecting that potential with educational opportunity. And ultimately, that connection is providing two essential outcomes for higher education, the talent to meet the increasing workforce needs and an educated citizenry that shapes the quality of our democratic society. So you have already approved our individual enrollment plans. Thank you. Uh, we are now shifting that focus, as Provost Hansen has said, to the collective. Today's presentation is not about enrollment management at Rochester, or Duluth, or Morris, or Kirkston, or the Twin Cities. Today, we're inviting you to think with us about joint recruitment efforts for the University of Minnesota as a whole. We'll be sharing endeavors that are already in progress, as well as opportunities for additional enhancements. The recommendations have emerged from the good work of a system enrollment management council. It's comprised of our admissions directors and vice chancellors and others from the university's five campuses. Such activities remain a priority and will be embedded within continued system strategic planning. We can increase enrollment at the University of Minnesota by working better together across the five campuses of this great system. 
it can be tough to coordinate. We are all motivated to do well for the campus we've been hired to serve. There's no enrollment professional focusing on the intersections among us or total system enrollment. But because we know our responsibility is to serve the state of Minnesota, we look forward to optimizing how we work together. And we appreciate your interest in the future of these cooperative endeavors. Mergers are becoming more common across higher education. How fortunate that though our five campuses have histories and strengths that are distinctive, we are already connected by our unifying land grant mission and this governing board. As we look for operational synergies and stay focused together on our mission to serve this state through education, research, and outreach, we see both challenge and opportunity. I can't overstate the workforce demands that compel us to be aggressive about recruiting human potential to this university. Based on independent analysis of the Federal Reserve Bank analysts, uh, Neil Kashkori, their president, concludes uh, that there is a future workforce demand that is looming as, in his words, a nothing short of a crisis unless we educate more of our citizens as well as pursue migration of talent and potential from other states. We believe all five campuses of this university can thrive into the future if we work together with the shared goal of better serving Minnesota. In this presentation, Vice Provost McMaster will provide important context, sharing current and future trends that will be familiar to some. Then we'll focus on three action areas. Chancellor Black will share information about the first actions being pursued, emerging recruitment marketing endeavors that seek to connect future students to the University of Minnesota campus that is the best fit for them. Chancellor Holtz Clause will describe recruitment pipeline opportunities, focusing especially on ideas to engage with K-12 students in light of increased diversity in that segment of the state's population. Chancellor Baer will share current and imagined expansions of academic pathways among our five campuses. And then I'll conclude and we can have a dialogue. We have selected this topical presentation structure to emphasize both the importance of working as a system and the contributions of each campus. Context first, then in order of how we expect to expand system marketing, pipelines, then pathways. Vice Provost McMaster. Yes, uh, Chair McMillan and members of the committee, what I'll start off with is a, um, a graph showing the trends of Minnesota high school graduates uh, over the last um, 30 years or so. Um, so these are the newest high school graduate projections. Remember, they're just that, they're projections. Uh, and one can see on this graph the considerable variation over the last 20 years, the peaks and valleys of the geodemographics. Uh, we're on an upward swing that will peak in around 2025. You can see that from the graph at about 67,000 uh, Minnesota high school graduates. Uh, over the next four years uh, after that, you see a drop. Um, we'll, be, we'll be heading downhill for a while. And then out into the mid uh, or early 3030s, there's another uptick. I wouldn't uh, take much confidence in curbs out that far. Uh, the projections can change significantly uh, even year by year. <clears throat> Wichi, um, that's a Western inter, interstate group that compiles these data on a regular basis, collects the public data, analyzes it, and then produces their projections every few years. So this produces lags at each step. And so the, the 2016 projections are based on data through 2010, 2011. Thus, you see the line at that, at that point. That's when the projections were actually, or the data for the projections was uh, compiled. Um, the next slide gets into some of the uh, uh, differences in geography. Uh, the total Minnesota high school graduates are depicted on the left axis of this graph. Uh, the system-wide catchment, uh, that is the number of students we bring into our system of Minnesota high school graduates uh, is depicted on the right. Uh, over time, the U of M system has enrolled pretty consistently uh, approximately 10% of Minnesota high school graduates, 6% on the Twin Cities campus, 4% on the other campuses. What's interesting is that these two curves you're looking at are, are remarkably similar in, in form. 
And over the last few years, the U of M has been enroll enrolling a slightly higher number of Minnesota high school graduates. You can see that as the yellow curve rises above the maroon curve. Mm -hmm. The next graph shows the continued depopulation of greater Minnesota. This is a rather troubling, troubling uh, graph for us. Over the last 15 years and the increases in the Twin City, uh, Cities Metro High School graduates as uh, the Twin Cities population has grown. Uh, greater Minnesota, interestingly, has seen a slight uptick over the last five years. Uh, and we think a more accurate depiction, if we could drill down into the data, might be uh, the Twin Cities metropolitan region, the suburbs, and then greater Minnesota. There are really three parts of the geography here. Uh, as a reminder, the Twin Cities metro area has about 3.5 million people, and the greater Minnesota uh, areas have about 2 million people uh, for a, a population of about 5.5 million. The next map, this beautiful choropleth map, depicts the data uh, that you saw on the previous graph. Uh, some of the declines in greater Minnesota are striking on this map. Uh, greater than 50% in west central Minnesota. Uh, one can see some of the geographical anomalies that of course would occur at a scale like this, such as the north shore of Lake Superior, uh, I forget which county that is, Lake or Cook or something like that. Uh, Thank you, Lake. Uh, uh, I, should, I, should, I should get my grade down for that one. And southern Minnesota. You're the geographer, right? Yes. <laughs> Let's see, Lynn. What about that county? <laughs> Uh, well, one, one county that really shows out here is Scott County, which is, has uh, seen a 50% increase in high school graduates. So quite a bit of variation here. Uh, next slide gets into the diversity of the changing population. Over the last 30 years, the majority of the increase in Minnesota high school graduates has really been with students of color and American Indian students, as you can see with these curves. Uh, note in particular the growth in Hispanic, Latinx, and African American students. Uh, the growth with American Indian students has been relatively flat, and increasingly we're going to have to be attentive to the multi-race category, which will continue to grow and will make longitudinal analyses somewhat more problematic. Next slide. So this particular map, which you've seen before, provides the newest data on the outmigration <laughs> of students with, with a ratio of 2.85 uh, to 1. Uh, students going out to uh, the Dakotas and to Wisconsin. Uh, of course, you've seen some of the data before. North Dakota is very clever at their discounting for students to bring in their tuition um, just under our rates to make sure that flow continues. Uh, for instance, the North Dakota State University Minnesota resident rate uh, is $5,350 less than our tuition and fees in state. So $5,000 cheaper to go there. Uh, the, uh, this, this particularly, as you can imagine, hurts our greater Minnesota, western greater Minnesota campuses, these particular trends. Um, sadly, this is your last map of the presentation. This is the national <laughs> high school enrollment landscape. Um, this is the last map that Eric Kaler will ever see me uh, present. Oh, I'm sorry so about sad. that, Eric. I'm, I'm also sad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, as you can like see, it, at the national scale, um, the Rust Belt is going to be hit very hard here with some states uh, uh, predicting a 7% decline, uh, significant declines also in the northeastern United States. Uh, as an example of the problem for us, we recruit heavily from the state of Illinois, and so we have to be attentive to that. Another interesting piece of the geography here is that the significant growth is coming with the low population states <coughs> in the West, but we have to continue our national level recruitment in, in certain areas. Next slide. Uh, we wanted to make sure we touched on Share My App. That's the program where when a student applies to the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, she or he gets a letter from our admissions office uh, saying, would you be interested in any of the other campuses? Uh, and you can see the trends here over time with Share My App. Now, what's striking here is the decline, and to make a very long story short, in 2017 and 2018, uh, nearly all of the campuses migrated to the Common App. 
When we went to the Common App, it meant that students no longer needed to participate in Share My App because they were engaging through the Common App application where they'd already filled out all the material. So that's not really a, a purposeful decline. It's a result of changing application platforms and strategies. The next slide shows kind of a similar trend uh, with the enrollees from Share My App. We can get into issues around Share My App later. And then finally, it's just a summary of, of the major points that we've tried to make here. The last point I think is an important one. The Share My App program probably needs to be revisited and redesigned if we want it to be effective now, given these new platforms. And we'll turn it over to I can joke with Dr. McMaster, he and I both received our doctorates at the University of Kansas, and so if uh, any of us, either of us has deficits, we both do. <laughs> Chair McMillan and members of the board, uh, it's truly really a pleasure to be speaking with you again today for a short period of time uh, about a very, very important topic. Uh, this, is, this is a topic that has gotten the attention of, of the Chancellor for some time. It's something we take very seriously and it's something that we're excited to see continuing to move forward and I think we're on the verge of seeing some really meaningful results. The marketing, messaging, and branding action area is really critical to our success in further defining the University of Minnesota system and in the action items we are discussing with you today. I want to recognize Matt Kramer and his incredible colleagues uh, for their collaborations on these efforts. Uh, they've, they've been uh, great partners and we're looking forward to continuing to work with them because we have some very challenging work ahead but uh, I think we're gonna do it with good collaboration and good spirit. Uh, developing the University of Minnesota System Identity Guide is one good example of this collaboration. Collaboration with the professional communicators on all of our campuses as well as with university relations. And we have worked very hard to better define and describe what it means to be the UMN system. There are three major components of this identity guide that I'd like to share with you uh, this afternoon. Uh, the first is the UMN uh, system logo. Oh, we went too far back. That's it. Um, system logo. It represents all five campuses. Its goal is to establish consistent identity for the system that fits within brand guidelines and can be easily used by all campuses and communicators when talking about the University of Minnesota system. Implementation and refinement requires ongoing collaboration with university relations and with the communicators on all of our campuses. Next is the positioning statement. I won't read this entire thing for you, but I think it captures well what we're attempting to do here. We talk about five distinct campuses. We talk about the fact that collectively the University of Minnesota system is one of the most comprehensive in the nation with offerings to meet the interests of every student and the changing needs of our society. Next we have a series of key system messages, thank you, um, that emphasize the fact that we are indeed one system with five campuses driven by a singular vision of excellence for all of Minnesota. We talk about five strong campuses, one strong state. We discuss individual messages for each of our campuses and we're focused on using consistent language and style. The next thing we're quite excited about is finally launching a new system-wide website. This has been in development for some time. It's something that the chancellors are, uh, think is extremely important for us to continue to move forward in these important areas. This is a screenshot of what the new system web page uh, will look like. Uh, the URL will be system.umn.edu. And we do think that this is critical for our collaborate, collaborative recruiting efforts. Uh, we expect this uh, website to launch by the end of June. And then we also anticipate ongoing updates and refinements in the months ahead. We also anticipate that there will be a phase two of the website focused keenly on recruitment and enrollment. Phase two of the website is a critical step in the success of our recruitment, enrollment, and the overall success of students on all five of our campuses. It's going to recognize the unique qualities of each campus. 
It's going to have consistent messages to improve efforts to recruit students to campus of best fit. And this is important. We're not just trying to get students to our campuses. We want, we want to make sure they go to the right campus for them, not just increasing our own numbers, but unless we have a good fit between the, the student and the culture of the campus and the academic offerings of the campus, they're not likely to be successful. So that campus fit is incredibly important. We also will emphasize the value and quality of the UMN degree. So the information that will be presented in a few minutes by Chancellors Holzclaws and Bear on pipelines and pathways are also two examples of additional information that will be added to the website during the next phase. Another action, important action step is the Enrollment Communications Work Group. This is comprised of representatives from the system enrollment management professionals and from professional communicators on all five campuses. This group is researching best practices and setting action plans. They are in the process of the creation of system re uh, recruitment messages, <laughs> system brand marketing and recruitment materials around the theme of five strong campuses, one strong state. This will also include the use of videos, uh, use of common press release language, as well as event signage. They'll be developing financial aid specific messaging relative to the top competitors, emphasizing the value proposition of attending a University of Minnesota institution. And they will also deal with specific information and messaging uh, that considers the D Dakota migration, the Wisconsin migration, as well as a uh, migration to Iowa to try to stem that tide. So another important next step for us will be identifying system-wide funding to ensure implementation of these action items. As Chancellor Carroll referred to a few minutes ago, these activities require energy, they require focused effort, they require expertise. And so we'll be looking forward to speaking with you about that on an ongoing basis. So I think much has been done, but much more will be accomplished through the system identity guide through the system website, and through the enrollment communications work group. We are focused on actions that produce results for the mutual benefit of all five University of Minnesota campuses. Now I'll turn it over to Chancellor Holzclaus. Chair McMillan and Regents, we know to address the change in demographics of the upcoming students, we need to be focused on our messaging, programming, and very intentional in our actions to bring new students to the University of Minnesota. As Vice Provost McMaster explained, the percentage of students of color has dramatically increased over the last 20 years, and this will continue. We currently have programming throughout the state in engaging our underrepresented populations. One very successful program, which many of you are familiar with, is the 4-H program. 4-H is part of extension within a college of the University of Minnesota and is Minnesota's largest youth development program with more than 65,000 members. 4-H programming is sometimes called the first class that you'll take at the University of Minnesota. And data tells us that 4-H members are more likely to attend post-secondary education and in Minnesota are more likely to attend a four-year institution. The purpose of the 4-H Campus Immersion Program is really to immerse middle school-aged young people. Now that's early adolescence, that's 10 to about 14, to get to immerse them in a campus experience so they can explore academic interests, they can meet other students, begin to envision themselves as college students, but also take those steps to help them to become ready and prepared for college when the time is right. And it's also there to help plant seeds, to get them to say, yeah, I think I can be on campus someday. At high school, it's almost too late because they've already decided in middle school whether or not they want to go to college. So it is this critical time that we really, really want them to say, hey, this is for me and I can do this. So they come onto campus, they stay for four days and three nights in the dormitories, they eat in the cafeteria, they ride the shuttle, and they engage with STEM and STEM learning, with faculty and staff and students. In order to really move this nation of ours, we need to build the next leaders, you know, and, and so to do this, today is when we have to expose them to some of these great careers that we have. And so by partnering with, with 4-H, by 
exposing some of these kids to some of these programs have been not only very beneficial to the community, but it's been very beneficial to, to the youth and the families that we serve. Like so far, I really like all the science things here, so I might look into that. I enjoyed the virtual reality experience because I was able to look inside a room someone else created and designed. I like this college, so I think about it as my mom if I could come here. I remember a kid last year saying, this is my key to my dorm. This was his, he belonged here. And that's so important because we know from research that if young people can't actually see themselves going to college in the future, then all those other things that they need to do to achieve it are so much harder to achieve. So it's really important here at Campus Immersion that we foster that imagination that they have to see themselves having higher ed in their future. The 4-H immersion experience began in 2014, and so now we'll soon have enough data to really be able to tell, did this move the needle? Did this make a difference on encouraging students to uh, attend the, a university, and preferably the University of Minnesota? Also, 4-H just recently received what's called a CIFAR grant, which is called a Children's Youth and Family at Risk Grant through the U.S. Department of Agriculture. It's a five-year grant of around $650,000 that will We'll focus on really trying to bring more Hmong um, into the, excuse me, Somali uh, students into the uh, campus immersion program. So this will focus in two communities in Minneapolis and Moorhead. We'll start with sixth graders and follow them from sixth through twelfth grade on that. So we look forward to bringing you good statistics uh, down line about the impact that that has also had. This past year, too, this, the uh, university has come together uh, to also begin to do a campus immersion place called Youth Central, where there are more than 165 immersion activities are listed in one place, and where students and parents can search by region of the, of the state, age, or topic, and register for programs. Some of these programs also have funding to help undercut the financial costs on this. And this video that we're going to watch in just a moment reflects the efforts of that Youth Central program from robotics camps in Crookston to STEM camps in Duluth. things about bees. Without bees we wouldn't have chocolate. They can pique their curiosity without having to worry about tests. Kids are out here learning about arboriculture, about climbing trees, and really about career paths. Could I be a, a professional tree climber, a professional urban forester? I mean sometimes it's tiring but it's worth it. We get to see a lot of birds. I've learned about raptors and I've got to see a peregrine falcon. It's really fun. It's just like you get lots of new experiences. These kids are getting some experience with building robots. Water robots. Getting them interested in science and technology, it's a simple hands-on way to do that. It's so fun to make the stuff that you eat. <laughs> what we're trying to do is introduce teens to healthy cooking so that they can do it within a budget. It can be a really isolating condition. I thought I was the only person who started, but now I know that other people started too.
other programs focusing on early academic pathways are programs such as the umpti Ump, which is an accelerated mathematics option for students. Successful students are granted honors levels college credit for the courses they take in umpti Ump, and it's currently available in Twin Cities, uh, Duluth, and on the Rochester campus. The National History Day and the camps are held on all five of our campuses, and the Global Youth Institute, which is part of the World Food Prize, is held in the Twin Cities, in Crookston, and Morris, and it examines world hunger issues and focuses on uh, issues of food as a social justice. Students provide solutions to hunger issues in selected countries, and this program honors the efforts of one of our most famous alumnus, the late Norman Borlaug. Of course, we have STEM camps, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math, and STEAM camps, uh, science, technology, engineering, arts, architecture, agriculture, whatever that A may be for others, and math, and then scrubs camps, which provide students exposure to the medical fields. We're also to, uh, continuing to scale up our ramp up readiness programs in Minnesota. This program, which was started five years ago, is a series of activities which is currently being implemented in more than 200 school districts across Minnesota. Throughout the school year, students in grades 6 through 12 spend about one hour each week in age-appropriate activities addressing pillars of college readiness, including academics, admissions, career, financial, and social and emotional readiness. And it's used a wide approach to support all students in getting them prepared for post-secondary education. Developed here at the U, it provides this easy to use living curriculum that strives to engage students. Raise Me is another example of preparing students for universities. It is on the Twin Cities and Duluth campus currently and is in the process of being implemented in Morris and Crookston. This program for high schoolers is available at no cost to the students, although our universities do pay a subscription fee. Students complete their Raise Me portfolio by addressing course grades, club involvement, sports, and volunteer activities. And for each achievement, they can earn a micro scholarship from the colleges they are following. This provides both incentive and access for students. And at our respective universities, then, we deem what's important to our student success and retention and then determine what we would award those scholarships for. We have more than 26,000 students across the United States who are currently following our four University of Minnesota schools. So there are really more than 200,000 program experiences each year for our students to participate here at the university. Mm -hmm. Still, we know there are many, many more opportunities for engagement. And we need to be very intentional and integrate messaging in all that we do. Why does college matter? And provide readiness into our programming. We also need to ensure that and identify all those programs that we do throughout the state, that even those that are done off campus, for instance, at the Raptor Center or in Tasca, all of those display their connection to the University of Minnesota. So as we go forward, we look forward to further development of more of our K through 12 pathways through our system and strategic planning area and looking at more opportunities for greater coordination of those uh, opportunities for our students. Now I'll turn it over to Chancellor Baird. Thank you. The third action item in the system-wide strategic planning world is to build and make explicit pathways. The pathways that exist today between and among the five campuses are manifest in a variety of forms, and I will highlight just a few of these in today's presentation. Intercampus student transfers, multi-institutional registration, and other forms of course in student sharing, as well as pathways for undergraduates to graduate and professional programs within the system. While there are some programs and systems in place, my fundamental message is that there is great opportunity through system-wide enrollment management and collaboration to build more and more creative and comprehensive opportunities for our students to take advantage of the range of programs and experiences that exist within the University of Minnesota system. While there are transfer students who enter a University of Minnesota campus from outside the system, what I want to highlight today are the intra-university transfers, or IUT, 
students who are new to a particular University of Minnesota campus, but previously attended another University of Minnesota campus. Last month, Vice Provost McMaster showed you figures for each of the campuses. What this graph shows is a summary of the number of graduates who transferred from one University of Minnesota campus to another for each of the last 10 academic years. On all five campuses, the proportion of transfer students coming from another UMN system campus relative to the overall number of transfers is relatively small, no more than about 12% of all the transfers on any of the campuses. These numbers represent an opportunity for us to work more systemically to retain students within the University of Minnesota system. As you heard last month in Dr. McMaster's presentation and as represented by the slide reproduced here, new systems that expedite and simplify the process for students seeking to transfer credits to one University of Minnesota campus from another campus have been put into place. The Transfer Evaluation System, or TESS, has successfully handed over 80, handled over 80% of transfer course evaluations for the University of Minnesota courses, a very positive development for our students. In addition to student transfers among campuses, existing collaborations offer resources for current students to take advantage of our system's diversity, enriching student opportunities. For example, there are situations where, because of high student demand and scarce numbers of qualified instructors or insufficient demand on a particular campus to warrant a full-time resident instructor, it makes sense to share instructors or courses across campuses. During the academic year just ended, students from multiple University of Minnesota campuses participated in Dakota and advanced Latin language courses through simultaneous video instruction. Students were enrolled through individual sections created at each of their home campuses. A second way that we work together is by providing opportunities through multi-institutional registration. A consortium agreement exists among the five campuses that allows students to take camp classes, including online classes, from another campus within the university system. Under this agreement, students attend classes on another campus for either fall or spring semester during an academic year without losing their status or maybe even more importantly, jeopardizing eligibility for student financial aid assisted programs at their home campus. Tuition dollars are shared between the campuses and students benefit from the opportunities to take more in-depth courses, including online courses on particular topics. Multi-I creates opportunities to enhance degrees and connect students to the strengths of each institution. This program also opportunities, offers opportunities for students who intend to complete their degrees at their primary campus and who need to take courses closer to home or online while off campus tending to physical health or mental health or other family needs. This slide shows the numbers of students over the last five academic years who have taken advantage of the multi-I program, of the opportunity to relocate, that is to take courses only on another or host University of Minnesota campus, or to supplement coursework on their own campus with enrollment in courses on another University of Minnesota campus. So those are the home and host people. Another potential area for collaboration are pathways from undergraduate to graduate and professional programs. These kinds of programs are not only great for our current students, but they are powerful undergraduate recruitment tools for the participating campuses. So I want to just give you two examples today of, of programs like this that we have. The University of Minnesota School of Nursing Master of Nursing program offers an early decision program for students from Crookston, Duluth, Morris, and Rochester. High achieving students with any undergraduate major who have completed 61 to 90 credits may apply in their junior year for acceptance to the program on the Twin Cities campus. 
If accepted, they enter the Master of Nursing program upon completion of their bachelor's degree. For students who are interested in a nursing career, this option provides clarity and certainty around postgraduate plans. The Veterinary Food Animals Scholars Program, or VETFAST, at the Twin Cities College of Veterinary Medicine is open to students at Crookston and the Twin Cities campus with undergraduate majors in animal sciences and students at Morris majoring in biology. Acceptance into the program happens at the end of the freshman or sophomore year, allowing students to complete a bachelor's degree and a doctor of veterinary medicine degree in seven years rather than eight. During the 2018-19 academic year, 25 students were participants in the VETFAST program, including students from all three of the participating campuses. Of course, these opportunities are only the tip of the proverbial potential iceberg. There are other programs that already exist, such as the BAMD Joint Admissions Scholars Program offered to students enrolled in the College of Liberal Arts on the Twin Cities campus that offer opportunities to be more widely available to students on other system campuses. An example already in progress of ways in which we can work together systematically to build these pathways is the Health Professions Pathways Initiative housed in the Twin Cities Pre-Health Student Resource Center. This effort is one robust model for building pathways to benefit undergraduate students on all five of our campuses, build system capacity, and it represents true collaboration across the system. Dedicated to providing coordinated support and creating opportunities for underrepresented students to successfully matriculate into health professional programs, this initiative is the work of a system-wide task force with over 60 participants from across the five campuses. Work, which is ongoing, began during the fall of 2018 to shape the initiative's mission and vision, define outcomes, identify barriers and strategies to overcome them, and set a plan for program implementation. While exciting, the Health Professions Pathway Initiative is also an illustration of how time, resource, and labor intensive these undertakings are. Coordinating across the system isn't simple or without cost, but we believe in its importance and we are committed to continuing to work together to develop and build pathways for our students. Finally, next steps. There is much room for optimism here. We are having productive conversations and there is much energy, as I hope you've seen today, in working together to build capacity and cooperation for our students and our future students. As we think about the next steps, it will make sense to inventory those pathway programs that already exist, to think about how we can systematize and extend those existing programs to all of the appropriate campuses within the system, to create new pathways, and then to market and publicize these collaborative pathway programs. As Chancellor Black noted earlier, the effort, the effort to ramp up our marketing, messaging, and branding about the advantages of the system are really key in making all of these current and future initiatives work. Now, Chancellor Carroll. We believe that each campus benefits from a strong system and that we have the capacity to serve more undergraduates well in our varied environments. That's why system enrollment management remains a priority. There has been progress, as you've heard about these actions today, and for that we thank members of the System Enrollment Management Council and University Relations. The spirit of collaboration is authentic, and it leads us to optimism about what's next. Over time, this phased approach to further coordination will require resources. We have reason to predict a strong return on such investment, a return not only of increased enrollment, but ultimately of further contribution to meeting Minnesota's workforce and societal needs. Building on this momentum, we are advocating for significant and strategic enhancement of coordinated recruitment endeavors to attract and keep qualified students within the University of Minnesota system. We have not yet implemented all the good ideas that have been generated to serve this future approach, but we are making progress. The system marketing and recruitment work will be accomplished first. 
Then, as Minnesota citizens and other potential students become more aware of all the settings in which they can pursue a University of Minnesota degree, expansion of system-wide pipeline programs and academic pathways will be ever more feasible. Our System Enrollment Management Council will also turn its attention to potential system-wide strategies to lift retention and four-year graduation rates. For those efforts, it will be imperative that we apply research to practice to enhance the good work already in place on each of our campuses. We look forward to continued system strategic planning endeavors and expect enrollment management to be embedded within that process. These are really crucial conversations mm -hmm. as the success of all five campuses can be well served by a joint approach to enrollment management. Mm -hmm. Recruiting as a system has not been our past practice, but because we are unified in purpose, it can be our future. We're ready to continue working together, guided by our shared commitment to student success, the university, and the state of Minnesota. We really appreciate your interest in this topic and invite dialogue at this time. Thank you. Thank you, chancellors and, uh, and uh, Vice Provost McMaster. I wish I could take credit for uh, this being on the agenda, but uh, this being a, an interim stop for me as chair, I can't, but nothing uh, makes me happier than seeing our, uh, our five elements of this system come together around strategic initiatives like this. So I've got a quick couple questions and then probably some dialogue from, uh, from the board here too. Um, Dr. Map Master, could I? <laughs> um, sorry, sorry, Bob, that's just having fun with uh, something you started. The witchy data um, seems to be really fundamental in terms of where we go, and yet to this uh, economist slash historian, um, it seems dated. And it's like, is that really the best that's out there? And is because if we're going to know whether North Dakota should be dark blue on that one map or uh, or what it all builds upon data that feels old. And if we're going to go forward with strategies, I just wonder what your thoughts are. And there may be members of the other the group that have strong feelings too. But it's just, is that a bad feeling on my part that it's old and dated? And man, that's 20, 2011 for the last actual data point? Yes. Uh, Regent McMillan and members of the committee, I, I think you're right. Um, the witchy data, as with a lot of higher ed data, is somewhat problematic. Uh, even if you go to iPads and you pull data out of iPads, there's a lag to get the data out. And so our comparisons are always two to three years old with iPads. Same thing with witchy. I, I think you have to remember this is a huge data set that's compiled from the entire nation where you're, some states are going to uh, not be as, as uh, forthcoming with their data as other states. So thus the lag you see because of the comprehensiveness of it. Um, you probably should be concerned and, and I think one of the points that I tried to make is we do see a fair amount of volatility with these projections year by year. So I think we have to take them with somewhat of a grain of salt. All right. I got a couple other questions, but let me turn to the committee here and then we'll come back. Uh, Regent Simonson first. Thank you, Chair, and I really, really appreciate what you're doing, too. I've been on the board a little over a year, and this is something we've talked about at about every meeting, and I really appreciate the organization and what you presented here. I think it's very, very important. Um, I, I do have a couple of questions on that. Um, number one, how do test scores impact that? That's been an issue we've talked about before, test scores at the Twin Cities campus versus uh, some of the other campuses. Uh, is that going to impact that? Then I've got another question. Well, I think each of the campuses have their own separate admissions criteria, and so we would, in, with respect to test scores or test optional, as the case may be, um, and so we would hope that we could help students to find the appropriate campus given. You know, I like the idea of one university five campuses, and to differentiate that way does give me some concern, uh, but we can talk about that. The other one is you presented a lot of programs. Some I did, wasn't familiar with, the Youth Central and all the other ones, and, and I talked, I mentioned last time about extension, and, and this program, although I'm very supportive of what you're doing, is gonna come with cost. You mentioned revenue a few different times. 
And again, looking at extension, the, I don't, yeah, you had a map on there. We've got extension offices all over the state. And can that help with cost reduction by centralizing some of this stuff? I mean, 4 H is one thing, FFA is another thing, but all this stuff, can we centralize it to help with cost? Uh, thank you, Regent Simonson, for your question. Um, I absolutely uh, agree that, that there's an opportunity for us all to be working together through extension and to, we're beginning to do a lot more of that. It's like, for instance, um, when one person attends an event, we're extending that out to the other universities. You know, we're going to be there. Uh, would you like us to take your information and, and also help recruit from that? And to also use our extension offices throughout the state as gathering opportunities for places which we can recruit from. Um, we're doing some of that, and there's a greater opportunity for doing even more of that. Additionally, um, particularly for a lot of these youth pathway programs, Many of these have uh, contracts and grants, which fund them from the Lumina Foundation, from the Gates Foundation, the Cypher one, which came from USDA. And there's probably additional opportunities, which all of the, the chancellors and, and uh, the provosts, we've been talking about that going, working together to looking for some of those external funding that can help support and fund some of these pathway programs for more students to be even involved. Thank you. Regent Powell. Um, thank, thanks, Chair McMillan, and um, thank you to the presenters. I think these programs are really exciting, and um, you know, just uh, you get the feeling that this is the smart kind of marketing work that we need to be doing to expand enrollment, and so, uh, and just the range of creativity and the and the you know the variety of approaches. I think it's terrific. Um, so I guess the, here's this here's the suggestion. I mean, I, to me, the the prize here when we talk about increasing application and enrollment and retention, I mean, it is about numbers and you know numbers of you know students who come in and who can complete the work and expanded enrollment is is really, um, I mean, that's huge for us. And so the suggestion is that as you you know we continue to work our way into this. We take a page out of Regent Beeson's work and the, the metrics that we really start to set very specific numerical targets for what it is that we're trying to do. And um, I think that would be, that would do a number of things. I mean, it sort of puts, puts us on the hook for here's what we want to do, but it also, I think, then lends itself to um, evaluation and, you know, did this program work, you know, or didn't it? And working is we either got more applicants. And if it didn't, that's okay. We tried something that didn't work, but here's one that really is working like a charm and allows us to make investment decisions. So I would just encourage you that it is, this is sort of a numbers thing and we should get metrics and be very specific about the numeric targets as we, you know, develop and, 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 and uh, implement these various programs. But I, I think it's, it's really exciting to see this work. Anybody want to respond? I don't think you need to, but uh, all right, uh, Regent Mayeron. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman McMillan. Uh, turning to, this is in our materials. I'm not sure because your slides are a little different than ours, but I'm looking at what was on um, pages 13 and 14 of our slides where it's showing the uh, migration of students in and out of Minnesota uh, to the other states that surround Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, uh, who's a, a, a new person to this, the, the numbers are startling to me in terms of seeing the migration out of Minnesota as compared to what is coming into Minnesota from those surrounding states. Um, and I recognize, first of all, this is data from 2016 and 2017. Am I correct that the the, this migration in and out continues it right now is uh, looking the same for 2018, 2019. In other words, more of uh, we're seeing fewer students coming in from out state than are migrating out from Minnesota to the other five state or four states. Is that still correct? Vice Provost McMaster. Yes, uh, Chair McMillan and, and um, uh, Regent Mehron. Um, I, I want to be, be clear uh, that I'm looking at the same graph you are, or map that you are, because we I did it's put... it's that one and then the one but right before it as well is what's in our materials here. Okay. 
Not this one. Not this one. That one I'm looking at. There, there. Uh, that one's 2017, and then okay. The, okay. the one right it, and our materials that precedes it is 2000 fall semester 2016. Okay. Showing the migration of new freshmen entering four-year public institution no. in the Upper Midwest. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, I, I I don't think we're going to see any significant change as we move forward in those patterns okay. because they've been fairly fixed over time. The one place where we've seen some variation that's worth noting here is as you go to the second map, which is the detailed map on institutional exchanges, and the slide after that, which I think you have, which is on uh, Wisconsin and, and Minnesota in particular exchanges. Maybe that's not in there. Yep. Is there another slide after that? No, that's, these are the two I was looking okay. at. Okay, the so we were up. There, there, there was another one that was um, in the deck, and in the end, we, we decided to take it out. Uh, with Wisconsin and Minnesota, uh, Wisconsin had always enrolled fewer Minnesota students than Minnesota had enrolled uh, Wisconsin students. That's Madison to Twin Cities. Right. We saw an evening out about five years ago where it was somewhat even Stephen, and now a shift again where there are more uh, Minnesota kids going over to Wisconsin. In fact, over time we've seen Wisconsin enroll fairly consistently 10% Minnesota students through reciprocity. So I don't think we're going to see any significant change with those patterns. We continue to be in large part because of the quality of our school systems are a net, a net exporter of students. Okay, and so if I could follow up my the Yes, question, Regent Mayeron. The, the questions that I have looking at this data is, again, ultimately our goal uh, as an institution is to hopefully um, educate our citizens or educate are not only our citizens but others and then hopefully retain them in Minnesota in order to meet the workforce shortage needs that are all anticipated. And so of course the concern that these graphs are if these if our Minnesota residents are going out state and they don't return to Minnesota after their four year education, then we have not advanced the ball in terms of meeting Minnesota's workforce shortage needs. Do we have any data on on for those students, for the migration out, as to how many ultimately return and then um, uh, enter the workforce here in Minnesota and meet those workforce shortage needs. Um, Regent, and I do have one follow-up question, to, and then I'll fly. Yes. 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 Regent Maron, uh, I'm going to flip that around for just a second. Okay. And for those students who, and this is, this is a Twin Cities number, it's not a system number, uh, for those students who come to the Twin Cities campus from out of state, uh, we retain about 20 to 25 percent of them. Some rough surveys show. Mm -hmm. In terms of those students who leave the state, we really don't know how many come back. Oh. Here's a hypothesis, though. I think a high percentage of students who leave our state from any, uh, from any place and go into Wisconsin probably return home in the end. And the reason I ask that is at least when I was over at the legislature trying to get this wonderful position, this issue of the, the direction and migration comes up with the legislators and their concern ultimately is, are we training people to meet our workforce needs? And, are, and those that we're losing to other states, are we losing them permanently and, not, uh, and, and they're not here to meet those needs? So that's why I raise it. And the question I have is, do you, do you think that these proposals and action plans you are proposing are going to stem or reverse this, these statistics that we're seeing? Or do we think that, in some sense, maybe it'll affect it somewhat, but given the differences in tuitions between Minnesota and these other four states, no matter what we do in order to try to recruit and try to uh, recruit system-wide, that our neighboring states are offering a better deal to our residents that we are just gonna keep losing our residents to other states. So I'm concerned about is there a connect between what you're proposing in order to stem what we're seeing here on these two graphs? Anybody? Fine. Yeah. All right, uh, uh, Chancellor Carroll. <laughs> Regent Mayron, uh, we don't know. Uh, we are quite 
confident that working together as a system, we can make that map look better and bring Bob back to show that map again. Um, and yet we're not sure that the activities would be completely sufficient and it will be a longitudinal study to get the kinds of numbers that Regent Powell was requesting. Does a middle school pipeline program work? Does a clearer path, an academic path from one institution to the next for graduate school within the system increase the number who stay here as professionals, that will be longitudinal. And so we will need to make educated hy hypotheses and I, the actions that we have planned working together as a system, we are strongly convinced that that will increase the, the total enrollment for the five campuses. And so we'll start to reverse that trend. And, and I will just say I am all for what you're proposing in terms mm -hmm. of a systematic approach mm -hmm. to enrollment as opposed to campus by campus. Mm -hmm. But I ultimately hope it's going to be at least be part of the puzzle to reverse the tide here. All right, uh, we went from limited interest to uh, just about everybody on the board being interested. <laughs> We've got roughly 10 minutes left. I mean, we can run a little over. But uh, Regent Kenyanya, you're not next on my list, but did you have a question related to Regent Mayron's? Yeah, I had a I thought it looked like you might. So why don't you go ahead? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, presenters, thank you very much. Um, my comment was on the the migration between the states. I just wanted to add that we should also look at it um, in terms of those states' populations. Um, the Dakotas are much smaller than we are. Um, they sent any more high school students. I don't know how many they have left, um, but it, 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 it'd be interesting to see that in terms of population, I mean, percentage of graduating seniors or something like that. I think it'd be something that we're maybe a little more comfortable with, um, but that's just my hypothesis. So that was the follow-up, but since I have the mic. Um, Go ahead. <laughs> um, not a question, but just uh, thanking the, the chancellors and the vice provost for this um, conversation that's been happening since I was a student rep, and it's good to see that um, we're finally moving in this direction because, um, the, you know, students that don't, go to one of our campuses, go somewhere, we'd, we'd rather have them at another one of our campuses, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Swiggum. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you, uh, Chancellors. Uh, thanks for the data. Uh, thank you for the information, the numbers, the trends, and your proposed programs. Suppose we were to change seats just for a second, and you were the benevolent decision maker here at the Board of Regents. <laughs> Give me the one thing Focus, the one thing we could do to help you, and maybe it's different in different campuses, the one thing we could do from a decision-making standpoint to help you in enrollment recruitment. One thing, I gotta I got focus. Chancellor Black, I'm gonna swing that first, uh, swing at that, and benevolent. <laughs> Remember he said benevolent, so. That's, uh, <laughs> yes, my son, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Chair McMillan and Reason Sviggum, I. I hesitate a bit to speak for all of us, although I think I most likely can. I think the, the, the greatest need we have is in this need for focused effort, energy, and attention to implementing these plans. We need someone who wakes up in the morning and is thinking about, what do I do today to help move this forward? And we've had quite a bit of discussion about that in terms of what is that a position? Is it a couple of pieces of positions? So we're not we're not bringing that proposal to you today. But I think um, part of our problem has been in the past is that we're doing a lot of good things in silos or in, or in a shotgun fashion. But the way we're really trying to change things for the better is to make that much more focused, make it more collaborative, make it a true system. But to do that, we, we have to have concentrated energy and and work uh, to make sure it happens because we're not we're not complaining but we're pretty busy in our current jobs uh, focusing on our, on our campuses and we need someone or someone's or something to uh, provide that continual focus and energy on implementing these plans. Right? How am I doing? Yes. Okay. Good. <laughs> 
Chair McMillan. Chancellor Carroll. Yeah, Regent Swiggum, thank you for the question. And I think that Chancellor Black speaks not only for the chancellors, but for the system, Enrollment Management Council, and the good work that they've been doing over the last two years when he identifies a priority when asked that question. We further understand that uh, this will be a conversation with our new administration as to what would be the, the absolute priority and first step. But I also want to highlight uh, the, the wonderful work uh, to uh, being done by a university relations to have a system landing page and an online presence that helps us look like the great system that we really are to showcase what is already real. And it is that communications work, um, our language choices that reveal the mind shift um, toward five strong campuses, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so that activity itself is setting the stage for whatever might be next, and, and we just want to fan that in all ways that we can. So that's a first action that's already in progress, and then I think Chancellor Black has described well uh, the kinds of discussion we've been having about what else is going to be really important to move this forward. Thank you. Um, I had as a follow-up question the Basically, what Chancellor Black said, is there an org chart solution here that may have disappeared when the board and President mm -hmm. Kaler eliminated Robert Jones's position and that, uh, and there hasn't been anybody with that kind of a system-wide look since then. And I, I don't know that we need that, but I don't know that there's an office anywhere that does that today. And I was going to ask that, so I, I'm not asking it now, but it seems to me Regent Swiggum's question is going to generate these kind of dialogues. Chancellor Black, something that you wanted to add there? Well, as, as one of the few people in the room who was here during Robert Jones's time, uh, it, it really didn't exactly exist then either. Obviously, Robert had system-wide responsibilities, but the kind of thing we're talking about is, is really an, a new concept, a new idea. And it's not that we haven't gotten help. We have, and, and I uh, appreciate Provost Hansen and uh, Joe Schultz from her office and others who have who have really helped us along and, and uh, Bob McMaster has been a great partner as well. But we're really talking about a new concept, a new new formulation of activities and action items that really I think requires a, a new way of looking at this administratively uh, that I don't think has been in existence before. Okay, thank you. We've got four regents left. Uh, start with uh, Regent Shu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, presenters. Um, I uh, had some similar questions to Regent Powell here about uh, the tracking of the student participants of all these programs and whether or not we, I mean, I heard some numbers like 26,000 and 200,000 maybe in terms of participants. I don't know if that's right or not, but um, that's what I wrote down. And uh, whether or not we could get some cost benefit analysis on, you know, how many of these students participating in our programs are actually applying here, um, being admitted and enrolling, all that kind of stuff. Now, some of these uh, earlier uh, graphs that we saw in charts, we've seen them before and the information just keeps on getting older and older and I'm wondering when we're going to kind of see some new information. Um, specifically, the, uh, the information about high school graduates. I mean, we should at least at now, or at this point in time, be able to assess whether or not in the last nine years that whether this graph is even accurate, right? Because we actually kind of know how many people graduated in 2018, 2019, 2019. Um, so I don't know what to make of this particular um, chart now, but it does, it does appear that if we've weathered kind of up until about 2020, that we're going to see a huge increase of uh, high school graduates in the next five years, six years. And so I'm not really concerned about that. Um, but going to this other chart where you have the migration, my concern here is that, you know, we're creating, we're part of creating the outcome here because a lot of this migration occurs because we're not admitting a lot of these students. And it's not clear, I mean, I thought maybe we had a, a, a graph similar to this that actually showed where uh, students admitted to the University of Minnesota actually ended up. Um, I didn't see it today. Um, 
so all I'm suggesting is that, you know, we're, we're part of this. We're creating this. By not admitting these kids, a lot of these uh, kids uh, that go to Iowa State, for example, are not admitted to our engineering college. And so they end up at Iowa State. And there's no way to get them back, um, you know, unless we actually give them an offer. And they're getting a pretty good deal to go down there. Uh, they're getting a uh, scholarship, kind of the Minnesota scholarship or the I-35 scholarship to go down there, which basically makes the cost of tuition quite similar to um, the University of Minnesota's, even though they're paying out-of-state tuition without reciprocity. You know, and then the, the Wisconsin schools, or was University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, a lot, I mean, it, it's, it's tough to see these kids go over there because a lot of, once you go to Madison, you're close to Chicago, and you're meeting a lot of kids from Chicago as, or Illinois, as you can see here from the numbers. And it, it's hard to get them back because they're, they've got kind of this pull uh, down to Chicago where, you know, there are a lot of jobs down there as well. And the same thing for the Iowa schools. The Iowa schools draw heavily on Illinois students, and a lot of those students go back, and they take a lot of other friends with them um, when they graduate. So I think, you know, if... If we had a better idea of how we're doing relative to the admitted students, that's one thing. But just to look at the migration, I mean, we're going to see this migration no matter what if we're not admitting these students or if they're not even applying to um, our schools. And on the issue of sharing of applications, it, it pretty much looks like the share my app thing is not working anymore. Um, if, I, if I remember seeing the the numbers, okay, so the total on, on my page 18, it shows that fall of 2018, U of M, I guess it's Twin Cities campus, sent a total of 111 students to a total of the other five or four campuses. So mostly to Duluth, uh, a few to Crookston, 11 to Morris, and 13 to Rochester. So. I don't know how you're doing the sharing, if it's purely through the app or if there's other things that are happening earlier in the process where students still have time to make a decision to look at another uh, school within our system. For example, if someone's not getting into the engineering school college here in the Twin Cities, are we referring them to Duluth or somewhere else? I mean, it's, it's hard to know what's going on. Uh, but. What I, can, what I can say is that you know, these numbers are small and um, you know, it looks like not much is happening, but maybe there's another method that actually is more effective that is not using this app. So I, I, I don't know what to do with this information. Um, and then lastly, I would just say that um, you know, working together, I don't, like you said, you, know, you guys all have things to do, but it, it all starts with the student. And if if you don't have enough students, you're going to have budget pressure, and you're going to have all sorts of other problems that are going to stem from that, as we talked about this morning. So I think it is important to try and retain as many Minnesota students here at any of our campuses. And if we can do that, then we're, we'll really be doing our jobs. Thank you. Any uh, responses on the application question that Regent Shu raised? I'd like to steer the debate away from the, the out migration. That's a big issue and we could talk about it all day, but thinking about system-wide planning and marketing is what we're here for. So um, thoughts, Reg uh, Vice Provost McMaster. Uh, Chair McMillan and Regent Chu, just a couple of quick comments here and we could of course continue this conversation. One is on where students go if they don't enroll on our five campuses. Um, that's a great point. Um, we do have very detailed information on that. It was not part of this presentation. But we know, based on going to the National um, uh, Clearinghouse, where the students go. And we've looked at those data over the last year pretty carefully. And it, it changes campus by campus. Uh, you mentioned it, admitting the students. And you, you, brought it, you brought in science and engineering, which is, of course, our most competitive college. Uh, we, we really can't admit that many more students to science and engineering. In fact, we can't admit any more students because of the capacity issues there that we've talked about. Uh, the question is, at what point in the admissions process can the Twin Cities or the other campuses release um, either the deny lists for students who are, not, who are not accepted or the wait lists? And we're in conversations about that. 
uh, we, the Twin Cities does push out the deny list to the uh, system campuses, greater Minnesota campuses. Right now, we do not push out the wait list till very late in the game because we're shaping our class well into mid-April on the Twin Cities, but it's a, it's a point of conversation. Um, uh, and I think you're correct about share my app. I think uh, with, uh, with the increased usage of the common app where I think for the Twin Cities campus this year, approximately 60 to 70% of the students use common app. Um, it's probably time to move away from share my app because it's a redundant kind of platform or redesign share my app. Um, well, let's see if Chancellor Bear has something to add on the app. Thank you, Chair McMillan, Regent Chu. We believe that if we do a better job of talking about the system and all of the opportunities that there are for students across the system, that we will increase the number of students enrolled on all of our campuses. Some of our campuses have capacity and some of the programs don't have capacity. But I can't tell you the number of times that I've encountered people who say, Morris, like, where's that? What's that? So I think some of, some of this has to do with really getting our message out there in a more strategic way to talk about the fact that the University of Minnesota diploma, which students who graduate from any of our campuses earn, has great value, and it has great value no matter which of our five campuses students attend. Regent Shu, very quick follow-up. We uh, still yes, got three you. regents interested in talking. So, thank you, Chair McMillan. Um, so have we, and maybe we've talked about this before, I can't remember if um, we've been able to have this discussion, but similar to other systems like, for example, University of California where you apply and then they tell you where you're admitted. Um, and whether you like it or not, you, I mean, you go there or you go to a private school or go to another state school or out of state or whatever. Is that something we've talked about where you, we have a huge number of applications coming into Twin Cities and we could say, hey, you know, and maybe we do this with a computer. We figure out that these people may actually benefit by being in Rochester, for example. And then we say, hey, sorry you didn't get admitted to the Twin Cities, but you're admitted to Rochester. Sounds like there's an answer. Yeah. Yeah. So, Chair McMillan. Answer the whole clause. Chair McMillan, reasons you. These are conversations that we are having right now, uh, trying to look at ways to potentially implement something like this so that a person will receive a letter, congratulations, you have been accepted to the University of Minnesota at. Um, and it's a process right now that the system enrollment group has been talking about. We're looking at potential ways to implement such a thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Rosha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll try to be brief here. Um, following on uh, Regent Aaron's um, comments earlier, and you, know, you guys are already, all, all of you folks are already diving right into, I think, the, the crux of these issues. One of the, one of the bits that, that uh, Vice Provost McMaster left out as he was giving this very good data about the number of non-residents who come here, who stay, and so on, is that residents who stay based on state data, and I think consistent with the university, <coughs> slightly more than two-thirds of Minnesota students stay. So when you look at the difference between 20 to 25 percent of non-residents staying versus uh, the, the strong majority of, of Minnesota students, you can see there's a big value in us ensuring that Minnesota students do have access um, to the university because they will, they will stay. And, and uh, President Kaler very aptly in, uh, a few years ago stated that the university is the, um, the only school that can attract top talent from outside the state. And, you know, the corollary to that, of course, it's the institution most likely to retain uh, top talent from within the state as well. So both of those um, uh, uh, apply. One thing that I think is really remarkable over time is, is how um, uh, tastes have changed. And, and we can see that rural, small rural liberal arts schools face a different marketplace than they did uh, a, even a generation ago. Um, and uh, whereas the large complex research university has had a uh, r remarkable resurgence or surgence, uh, as, as it were. Because um, you look at Iowa, which is a smaller population state, um, between Iowa State and Iowa, uh, by my quick math off the slide, it's you know, 6,254 Iowa students are at their two flagship research universities. And our you know, concentrated research institution, we have 3,700. So that's quite a few, that's 2,500 fewer 
uh, in-state students at, at the Twin Cities campus. Now, um, when you look at the number of Minnesota students that are in those, just adding them up off that, off that same chart, there are 4,700 Minnesota students that are heading out to those five states that would be potential students that, that would be here if there, was, if there was room. Now, how does that apply to this conversation with respect to um, the, the, uh, our system campuses? Um, it, you know, I think what you're doing is great. I'm, I'm very excited to see this conversation and, it's, and, and everybody's um, kind of identifying ways of raising awareness, because I think that's one of our biggest challenges, is people being aware of these amazing opportunities. Um, and, you know, Morris shall always be the crown jewel of the university system, because that's the way it's been to me for 30 years. But um, here's my question. We're still marketing a product. And one of the reasons why we know that migration uh, is is, is the, the way that it is, is these other states are really being pretty predatory <laughs> in the way that they're pricing their product to try to attract our students because they have population issues different than ours. To what extent, and, and maybe, maybe this is too much on the spot right now, but each of your campuses is operating within a specific competitive market different than the complex uh, research center uh, in the Twin Cities. The closest, of course, would be uh, UMD with with its uh, you know, similar offerings in, in science, technology, and so on. Uh, but even then, you're really playing as a regional campus. It, you know, it seems to me that you guys can do an awful lot of this work, but if you're priced wrong for your competitive market, we're still going to struggle to try to retain students who are being targeted very heavily by those schools that are around our state. Is there... Anything we can do, is this a conversation that we can engage in over time? And maybe, maybe rather than put anybody on the spot, I'll, I'll make the point that as we go into the strategic conversation, I'd be very interested in your campus feedback on each of your campuses as to whether that part of where we're positioning you in the marketplace is having an impact on our ability to retain top talent um, and to build the, the, the system uh, in, in, in that way. Um, I certainly would welcome any, any comments on that, but... It seems to me so fundamental that we can be absolutely brilliant in all of this other coordination, but if we're priced wrong, we're still going to have a really hard time reaching success. Thoughts from any of the chancellors on pricing relative to strategy? <laughs> Don't feel compelled. So, <laughs> Chancellor Black? I'll take a stab at this. We, we are very much focused at UMD on our direct competitors. And so we look at Mankato, we look at uh, St. Thomas, we look at St. Cloud, we look at uh, North Dakota State, South Dakota State, uh, we look at uh, Wisconsin-Eau Claire, uh, among others. And part of our success, I think, is in this value proposition that I mentioned, which is part of the work of, of our current task force. Because right now, it, we're limited in what we can do about our price point. Um, and so we, we talk instead about what we are able to offer and the success of our students. And I think if you look at the trends of enrollment with some of those schools I just mentioned, we're, we're not only just holding our own, but we're doing uh, quite a bit better than some of those institutions in this very challenging enrollment environment. Uh, we still need to do better, and we still have to be very focused on retention, which we are, and, and uh, appreciate some help we're getting from the system in, in that regard. Um, so it's, it's not just about price point, but it's about what you're offering for the price point. And as we look at the productivity of our graduates, where they're being employed, what they're doing, we have a tremendous number of of human interest stories. If you look at the research we're doing, how we're impacting society, a lot of students are coming to, the, to us for those reasons. So that, that's what we try to pitch. And I, I think overall we're, we're successful at that. Chancellor Carroll, quickly. Chair McMillan, uh, Regent Rocha, I would just echo uh, Chancellor Black, but also say that while we could each do campus by campus competitors and price point and other information, we really wanted to keep this particular presentation focused on how a, a system approach to enrollment management can lift enrollment 
for the entire system and for each campus. And for that, we are arguing for the value of a University of Minnesota degree. And we all offer a University of Minnesota degree and each one as valuable as the next. Thank you. Uh, Regent uh, Anderson, and then we're gonna close with Regent Beeson. I'll, I'll be very, very brief. I had more I was gonna say, but I know we're behind time, but I, I was gonna say a couple things. First, uh, Regent Mayeron, just, just so you know, I come from Alexandria. It's probably equidistance between here and Fargo, virtually right on the dot. And um, we do have a lot of students that go west to college, and we, we discuss that a lot. Um, I went up and talked with our superintendent and over time, seven of eight, Alexandria High School graduates go west. Cost is a big factor in that. Uh, we have Minnesota Crookston, 23 miles from the University of North Dakota. University of Minnesota Crookston is a little bit more expensive. Um, so that is a cost. But regardless of that, and, and I could argue that there are other reasons people go west, but I, we don't need to get into that discussion. What I think is really important here today, what I heard you say, and I think the word pathways to their education is absolutely valuable going forward. And I say that because when I went to college, back in the dark ages, going to college was a rite of passage. You got your dormitory room and you moved away from home. Today, students are laser focused on getting their education. And they do it, in many instances, at the least possible cost. They take dual credits as juniors in high school. They go PSEO in communities that have a tech college or something, so they let the state pay their next year of tuition, and then they finalize their last two years and pay for on their own. But they've lowered that cost. And I think what we have to do from the University of Minnesota is we have to provide pathways for these kids where they can find their individual way. And I think part of that, and I'm not so sure we do a great job yet, but uh, I know Chancellor Holtzclaw's looked into that, is, is getting, you know, God bless the Minsky system, but it's instead of getting those dual credits in the high school taught by Minsky deputies, I'll call them, we should get them taught by University of Minnesota accredited faculty and things. And it's not as easy as it sounds, but I think then we can give these kids pathways to move through. It'll save them money, give them different options. And uh, you know, I, I've been blessed to, while well, I've served on this board, have two children that have been going to college. Typical Alexander kids, they both went west. And they bring their friends home, and I quiz them all the time. In fact, they kind of quit bringing their friends over because <laughs> dad's always quizzing them about where they go to college. Uh, but I just think there's the K-14 program. We would not design school K-12 anymore. We would design it K-14 if we were starting over. And I think we need to be really cognizant of that and provide pathways. Thank you, Regent Anderson. Regent Beeson, our last word. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, presenters. Um, and uh, Regent McMillan, I know you didn't want to focus on the migration, but let's pull that map up again because you did submit it in your presentation. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I, I'm going to agree with Regent Roche about this pricing issue. And when I look at the, the um, difference between what we charge at Crookston, we charge a thousand dollar premium over what what people Minnesotans pay for at the University of North Dakota, I believe, right? We're paying a thought. We're paying a surcharge. Yes. Uh, yes, but and and those are the parts too where it's a part about marketing and helping people understand with the UM Promise and others right. we can and get yes, competitive. Yes, I agree. Thank you. There are, there's are some net but on the sticker price. I I think we've got this. I think we need. I mentioned this before. A Dakota pricing strategy. The, so the two western campuses can can um, compete better against those schools. Those are big brand schools we're dealing with, big sports. University of North Dakota, I think, is going mm -hmm. Division I football, FBS. I mean, we're just not being realistic. We're not giving them the tools because of pricing. It starts with pricing. Maybe it's not the whole thing, but I, I, I think we're missing uh, the pricing strategy. And second, did you pull that map up, uh, Mr. McMaster, because I'm going to revisit the Madison issue, OK? And so we now admit 200 more Wisconsinites than they take from Minnesota. Why do you think they're taking fewer Minnesotans? Because they're substituting our kids out for ones from New York. And they're, okay, 
we did the same thing and took kids from Illinois or out of state, we'd be raising a million back the napkin, a million six more per year. Okay, without maybe it reduces our ACT average slightly, but there has to be consequences to what they're doing. That's way too far of a spread. It's not reciprocity when they're when they're, there's a 200 student difference and both states are fairly similar demographically. So I mentioned this before. I think we got to uh, we got to sort of deal with it. The last point I would make is, folks, we're talking today about um, an investment. This costs money. We don't have systems people. Even when Bob Jones is here, as as Chancellor Black said, he wasn't doing the kind of work that we're talking about doing. So this costs money. Last month's conversation about transfers cost money. So we better be ready to put money in, and that's going to mean where are we going to get that extra money? It's going to be tuition. So please don't don't cripple the administration when they come in asking for a little increase because everything we talk about here is an additive cost. All right. Thank you. This uh, topic naturally leads itself into a whole lot of other consequential areas, as it just did. But uh, I think you heard from the, uh, the regents that uh, we appreciate this work, and uh, it's fundamental to moving forward on some broader planes. Um, Next step here, next uh, topic is graduate and professional education. This is the fifth installment of uh, a series that, uh, that Chair Omari and uh, the Provost have been putting together, and uh, now we're here to talk about the student experience. And I think as uh, Vice Provost Lanyon comes forward, uh, Provost Hanson, you're going inter to introduce this, correct? Yes, thank you, Chair McMillan, and in the interest of time, I'll stay here, but... <laughs> I'm um, that's absolutely right. The Mission Fulfillment Committee has dedicated, counting today, five presentations to graduate and professional education this year at the request of, of um, uh, previous uh, leadership of the committee. The previous four covered such topics as post-baccalaureate education's connection to the mission, academic planning at the post bac level, including attentiveness to state needs, market, competition, comparative advantage, in areas of faculty strengths, enrollment management issues, and diversity strategies at the post back level, and, um, and financial issues, student tuition and debt, student employment, fellowships, assistantships. Um, they covered university services and administrative support supplied at this level, and the direct and indirect impact that post baccalaureate education has on the state, the nation, and the world. Today, where we've been asked to discuss with you the graduate student experience with a particular focus on PhD students. The plan is to say a bit about academic advising, careers, and campus climate. Um, and again, uh, Scott Langan, Vice Provost and Dean of Graduate Education is here, and he's joined by Yoshi Shimuzu, the Associate Dean and the Director of graduate, the Graduate School's Diversity Office. Um, before I turn things over to Scott and Yoji, I, I want to reiterate very briefly the distinction, well, not that briefly, but <laughs> sort of briefly, um, the uh, distinction typically made, at least in academia, between graduate and professional education, and I emphasize again the significance of all varieties of post-baccalaureate education at the university. Um, and to foreshadow um, a bit where we're going at the end of Scott and Yoji's presentation, I am delighted we'll have a master's student from University of Minnesota Duluth, Gilles Fai, uh, briefly describe his research in one of the fabled three-minute thesis uh, presentations that um, Scott has been fostering. The difference between graduate and professional education is familiar, of course, to many of you, and we've discussed it when we first uh, set up this series. But it's a distinction worth clarifying as we return to the topics, because it's a distinction that doesn't loom very large or stand out very clearly for those not involved in the delivery and administration of post-baccalaureate education. It's also likely that the words are used differently, let's say interchangeably, by various constituencies and even by the alumni of our programs. But inside the academy, there um, is, for some good reasons, a first cut um, general distinction within post-baccalaureate education between professional programs and degrees and graduate programs and degrees. That first cut 
um, is summarized on the chart, if you could go to that. Um, the traditional graduate degrees on the left here um, are those where a major portion of the program involves original research or creative activity. The PhD degrees in this category as our most Master of Science and Master of Arts degrees. The professional degrees on the right include those programs whose graduates are prepared for professional or practice-based employment in the fields named in the degrees. Think here of doctorates in medicine or law or dentistry, along with some professional master's degrees such as Master of Architecture, Master of Social Work, Master of Public Health. One way to understand the distinction is in terms of the primary objective of the program. With graduate education, students are expected to acquire deep knowledge of a discipline and then to use that knowledge, both the uh, content and the distinctive methods, to create new knowledge, perhaps to challenge received wisdom or existing paradigms. Professional students, on the other hand, are expected to master knowledge in their fields, to know how to retrieve it, and to be able to apply it consistently, correctly, and creatively to the problems and issues they encounter in practicing their professions. Thus, a major portion of a graduate degree program involves research or creative activity and original scholarship for its own sake, so to speak, whereas professional degrees are structured to ensure that those who graduate from them are able to practice successfully in that professional domain, for example, in law or medicine which is typically, I mean, obviously there are lawyers and doctors inside academia, but we're talking mainly about preparing for practice outside of the academic environment. Other aspects of the distinction between graduate and professional education were sketched uh, in the slides that were included in your docket, and I won't repeat all that, but I will note again a general difference in mechanisms of quality assurance and oversight. With graduate education, quality assurance rests largely on university faculty and program leadership, with heavy but um, somewhat informal pressure from the disciplines themselves across the nation and the world, and broad oversight from the graduate school. Um, for example, mathematicians have a sense of what a doctorally prepared mathematician should know and be able to do but there's no accrediting body specifically in place for graduate level mathematics departments. Professional education, on the other hand, typically has external bodies that assist with quality assurance. These are typically field specific accreditors. And I might note that with the breadth of professional education here at the university, um, we have accreditation status with over 200 specialized and professional associations. Now these pie charts give you a sense of the portion of University of Minnesota students seeking a post-baccalaureate degree compared to undergraduate and non-degree students. As you see on the slide, more than 25% of our University of Minnesota students are graduate or professional students. Um, on this next slide, uh, you see the distribution between the number of graduate and professional degree programs. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, the, that's how we count them. There are lots of different ways of counting these. You may see that proportion look different someplace else, but that accords with the set of distinctions I've been making. So before we turn to Scott and Yoji and um, Gilles, I just want to make one more comment about the significance of graduate and professional education at the university, because we also obviously spend a lot of time talking about undergraduate education. Um, the University of, this is a crucial part of our identity. The University of Minnesota is classified by the Carnegie Foundation as an R1 doctoral university, very high research activity, which is the top rung of the Carnegie taxonomy. That status and our standing among the prestigious AAU institutions and some of our key national and international rankings depend upon the contributions of our graduate and professional programs and students. Graduate and professional education is, in fact, integral to all three elements of our mission, as suggested on this slide. Finally, um, the last, uh, this, this chart shows that the University of Minnesota is a key player in the world of graduate education, and by this metric, too, a key player in the production of new knowledge. This table lists the number of PhD, degree, PhD degrees um, awarded in 2017, and only 13 universities in the country award more PhDs. So um, 
With that background, I invite Scott and Yoshi to discuss the student experience. Thank you, Provost Hanson, Associate Dean Shimizu, and uh, Vice Provost Lanyon. Thank you, Chair McMillan, uh, Provost Hanson, members of the board. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to talk about graduate education and graduate students. Um, I'll take every chance I can get to do that. Um, <laughs> as a starting point, I'd like to point out how we know as much as we do about the graduate student experience, where that information comes from. University of Minnesota is actually a member of the CERU Consortium. CERU stands for the uh, survey or the student experience at research universities. And the consortium is a group of AAU institutions uh, that work, are working together to better understand the experiences that students are having on our campuses. And the advantage of doing this in a consortium way is that uh, all of the institutions are administering exactly the same survey so that when we get our results, then we can compare our results put into a context uh, with the other administering institutions. So the consortium has been administering an undergraduate version, the CERU survey, for about a decade or more. Uh, but several years ago, the University of Minnesota took the lead in developing uh, a graduate student version of this. We administered it in 2017. We had about a 25% response rate of our students. Uh, we just closed the survey again for 2019 with about a 35% response rate. Thanks to Grad Cerro, University of Minnesota um, probably is now amongst the global leaders in actually understanding the graduate student experience. Um, our results have generated so much interest that there are about, um, I think at last count, 12 other U.S. institutions that are now agreed to administer the survey. Uh, six of those are additional Big Ten institutions. And there are five international stu uh, institutions that have, um, are involved with Grad Cerro. So as you can see on the slide, Grad Cerro is a comprehensive survey gathering information about all phases of the graduate experience, from admission to overall satisfaction. Uh, it was designed explicitly with graduate research graduate students in mind. Um, but the University of Minnesota has actually piloted a version for the professional students just this spring. And we will be piloting a version for uh, postdoctoral scholars this summer. So this is really our primary source of information about the graduate student experience that we'll be talking about today. Now what I'd like to do um, is to focus um, our conversation on five aspects of the graduate student experience that have been gathering a lot of attention uh, nationally, uh, and, and there's some concern here. Graduate students are interested today in a wide variety of uh, career paths, not only careers in academia. But there's growing concern nationally that graduate education is designed primarily to prepare people for higher, higher education, uh, for academic careers. There's also concern about the quality of advising that students uh, are getting in graduate education. As with every sector of society, there's concern nationally about the slow pace of increasing diversity. And in a related topic, concern about the climate that exists on university campus, whether our campuses are sufficiently welcoming or inclusive. And finally, there's been considerable national press lately about the mental health of graduate students and the stress that they're experiencing. So for each of these topics, we'll try to give you a sense of the national picture, talk some about the situation here at the University of Minnesota, information largely gathered from through Grad Cerro. And then the steps that we're taking as an institution to improve the experiences of graduate students. So career path diversity. So in recent years, there have been many articles questioning the value of the graduate degree and suggesting that universities are perhaps producing more graduates with advanced degrees uh, than there are positions for them. And this comes from a misperception that the only career path for someone with an advanced degree is as a faculty member. And if you look, Current economic forecasts predict that employment and occupations requiring master's degree are going to grow by almost 17 percent between 2016 and 2026, the fastest of any educational level. Employment requiring a doctorate or a terminal professional degree is expected to grow by 13 percent. And all this is in stark contrast to the 7 percent growth expectation for other occupations. So what we know about PhD students nationally now is that less than half, actually right around half of PhD students are actually going to go on into faculty roles. Um, this actually is pretty variable by discipline. Uh, so as you can see here, engineering, a high percentage are going into non-academic roles, or the other into the extreme 
humanities, a high percentage are going to academia. The concern is that these two groups of alumni, those who pursue non-academic careers and those who pursue academic careers, might be experiencing graduation, uh, graduate education very differently. A recent national study found that the majority of PhD graduates in humanities who end up in academic careers feel that their graduate training was really excellent, really prepared them well for their careers. But that's not the same for, for graduate students, PhD students who ended up in non-academic careers. They're much less satisfied with, felt that their graduate education prepared them less well for the careers that they ended up in. So that's the issue. The issue that's emerging nationally is this concern about a disconnect between the training graduate students receive and the careers they're actually pursuing. So what's the picture at the University of Minnesota? So here are some results from grad Sarah. Let me explain how we're visualizing this data. Each dot here represents a different graduate program at the University of Minnesota. The vertical spread actually is, is unimportant here that we're just spreading the dots out so we can actually see them. So that's a meaningless axis. What I'd like you to do is focus on the horizontal axis, which is the percent of respondents that when asked whether their graduate program was supportive of non-academic careers, it's the percent who responded positively who felt the programs were supportive. So this graph is from 2017. We won't have our 2019 data analyzed until this fall. But as you can see, there's huge variability between programs. The program on the far right of the screen, 100% of students felt that their program really supported non-academic careers. While at the far left, 8% of the respondents in that program felt the same. Clearly, we have room for improvement in this area. So what are we doing? Oops. So the, um, oops, getting ahead of myself here. Um, so the university is currently developing a plan for locating our graduate alumni so that we have a better understanding of where our graduates go, both geographically and professionally. We're also part of a national study organized by the Council of Graduate Schools in which PhD alumni are surveyed to learn how effective their graduate education was in preparing them for their career. We're hoping to be selected this year to participate in a new AAU initiative, the goal of which is to better align graduate education with the diversity of career paths pursued by our graduates. An important step, we're increasingly encouraging graduate students to think about their career goals early on in their career and to produce an individual development plan. The purpose of the plan is to get students to think about the skills and the experiences they will need and to have them develop a plan for how they're going to acquire those if those aren't actually built into the curriculum that they're part of. Later this month, the graduate school will launch a brand new online orientation tool for new graduate students. And in that, we're doing a variety of things, but relevant to this conversation, we're encouraging students to develop those individual development plans. We're also going to be providing them with a tool to help them access the various professional development opportunities that exist currently around the university. So that gives you a quick idea of some of the things we're doing centrally. But of course, it's important to point out the colleges and programs are active in this space as well. Um, I'll point out that the two examples, the medical school has recently created a position for a full-time career development counselor for graduate students. And the College of Biological Sciences has developed a program they call Emerge Bioscience, which is a training program for both postdoctoral scholars and graduate students who know that they're going to pursue careers outside of academia to help them prepare for that. Now, relevant to some conversations that we had after the last presentation, um, might be interesting to know how this relates to where these students end up professionally. Uh, you know, if you could imagine that everybody getting a graduate degree was actually pursuing a job in academia, the expectation would be that the majority would actually be going, pursuing careers outside of the state of Minnesota. Um, but as I just said, the majority of our students are about at least half of our PhD students, the majority of master's students, aren't pursuing careers in academia. And in fact, if you look at the students who graduated with a post-baccalaureate degree from the University of Minnesota 2014-2015, in 2017, the data indicates that about 60% of them are still in the state employed here. And I wanted to mention that in this context partly because it's a reminder that University of Minnesota is one of the state's greatest assets for attracting bright, creative people, many of whom then choose to stay and contribute to our economy. Our next topic is advising and the relationship between graduate students and their faculty. 
first, I want to emphasize that when we talk about advising in graduate education, it's a completely different thing than what we mean when we're talking about advising in undergraduate education. For undergraduate students, the university has staff who help students figure out what courses they need to take, provide some career advice, and so on. Very important, different thing when we're talking about graduate education. In contrast, graduate education, each graduate student has a single faculty advisor with whom they work very closely throughout their career. That faculty member guides their development as researchers, and frequently they publish scholarly articles together. Often the faculty member is the one providing funding for the student, in terms of research funding. And ultimately, it's the advisor who decides when the student is ready to graduate. The advisor-advisee relationship in graduate education is critically important. If it's working, if that relationship is a healthy one, then a graduate student is very likely to complete their degree successfully. But if the relationship isn't working, then their odds of completing goes down significantly. And this relationship, and it's important to understand that this doesn't end just at the time of graduation. For many students, their career success depends on continued involvement of their advisor for many years after graduation, one of the reasons why this relationship is so critical. Not only is the student dependent on the advisor for letters of recommendation for years, they frequently continue to collaborate on research projects, and their advisor plays a critical role in helping students and graduates develop their professional network. It's frequently true that the advisor is the person who nominates and ultimately lobbies for their graduates to get jobs, for editorial roles, for leadership roles in academic societies, and for prestigious awards. So how are we doing at the University of Minnesota? The good news is that grad SARA data indicate that on average, University of Minnesota graduate students are actually very positive about their relationship with their advisor. So if you look, here are four questions from grad SARA. And if you look at that top row of figures, it shows that on average, students in graduate programs, 80% or more of them are quite happy with their advisor. That's good. The bottom row shows a slightly different story. That shows the range of satisfaction across graduate programs at the university. So yes, we have graduate programs where every student who responded to the survey is very happy with the relationship. But we do have some programs where only half of the students are positive about that relationship. And that's supported by this slide, where this shows that 67% of students would agree with the statement that they would recommend their advisor to other students. A third wouldn't. We would really like to change that. Right? That's something that we really would like to work on um, in the years to come. Definitely room for improvement. Now, it's important to note that this idea about the effectiveness of faculty as advisors, uh, we can both tell you neither one of us ever got any advice on how to advise graduate students. It's never, not part of the, the history uh, in academia. It's something we have to change. Um, so faculty haven't gotten that, but, um, but there, there's an eagerness uh, amongst faculty to be more effective in this space. So one of the things we're doing, we're working with Vice Provost Ropers uh, to offer new workshops uh, or workshops on advising uh, to new faculty. We've developed a, an online toolkit that we have on the grad school website that uh, provides a number of things that faculty can use to be more effective, to have these conversations, effective conversations with graduate students. It turns out that one of the main reasons why, if there is a, a, a unproductive relationship between a faculty member and an advisee, a graduate student, frequently it's because of poor communication, poor communication of expectations. And so we've been encouraging graduate programs to start um, being explicit about what the program expects of graduate students. We've also encouraged faculty individually to uh, issue their own personal statements about what they think, uh, what they expect of students, and what students can expect of them. Part of this is also spreading the load around. It's uh, unreasonable to expect a single faculty member to be able to provide all the advice and mentorship that a student might need. If a student approaches and wishes to pursue a career uh, in a nonprofit organization or an industry, approaches their faculty member, it's very likely the faculty member can't answer the question about what they need to do to be prepared. So to that end, we are increasingly increasing or encouraging graduate students to identify and work with mentors in addition to their faculty advisor. Lastly, I want to point out that a lot of the information we have about when things go wrong in, in that relationship 
is when students approach our Student Conflict Resolution Center, which does an excellent job, and they too, that organization, that unit, has come up with something called the Dignity Project, which they built some more advice for faculty based on what they've learned from talking with students when things don't work well. So now I'd like to ask my associate dean of the graduate school uh, and director of the graduate school's diversity office, Yoji Shimizu, to talk about these next two topics. Chair sure, McMillan, members of the committee, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you about um, the importance of diversity and a positive, supportive, inclusive climate to a successful graduate student experience. And we'll start first with diversity. Um, I think we recognize and numerous studies have shown that the quality and value of scholarship in academia really depends on the diversity of views and experiences of the people who actually do that scholarship. Uh, problems that seem intractable, questions that seem really impossible to answer to a homogeneous group of individuals can frequently be solved by a group that is diverse. So diversity is really um, uh, directly linked to research excellence here at the University of Minnesota. And diversity among our scholars also increases the likelihood that research outcomes will benefit individuals and communities from underrepresented and underserved populations and expands public trust in our institution. Uh, the value of increasing diversity in graduate education has been recognized by our peer institutions throughout the country, um, but it's pretty clear that we have a lot of work to do in terms of increasing the diversity of our graduate student population. This particular graph shows the percentage distribution of doctoral degrees, PhD degrees, conferred nationwide to U.S. citizens uh, by race and ethnicity. And you can see there have been some slight increases between 2010 and 2013 and 2014 to 2016. But again, the pace of this progress has been very slow and it's been so for a number of years. And similar trends are seen nationally when we look at the percentage of distribution uh, of master's degree recipients as well. And so this is throughout the graduate education continuum. Here at the University of Minnesota, we see a very similar trend. This is, uh, again, data showing the uh, percent distribution of doctoral degrees conferred at the University of Minnesota for two five-year periods, 2009 to 2013, and 2014 to 2018. And then again, you can see some uh, increases among, uh, for example, black and Hispanic students. Um, but again, the increase in diversity has been very slow and really does not reflect the racial and ethnic diversity of the U.S. population as a whole. So because diversity is so central to the quality and value of scholarship at the University of Minnesota, increasing the diversity of students receiving graduate degrees is the number one strategic priority of the graduate school here. And we are taking a number of steps to increase graduate education diversity. In the graduate school, we have a dedicated director of recruitment and outreach. This individual works with uh, and on behalf of our graduate programs to increase the diversity of graduate students that are applying to the University of Minnesota. The graduate school itself offers a number of different recruitment fellowships that graduate, our graduate programs can offer to individual outstanding diversity applicants, um, as well as cohorts of applicants that are applying to individual graduate programs that would enhance the diversity of that program's uh, graduate student body. Uh, the diversity of undergraduates throughout the University of Minnesota system is increasing. You heard earlier about the increasing diversity of our high school graduates here in the state. And so we are encouraging our graduate programs, all of our graduate programs, to recruit our own undergraduates to their graduate programs here in Minnesota. And we'll be helping our programs do this by organizing a University of Minnesota system graduate diversity conference and recruitment fair. Uh, plans are underway to organize this uh, conference and fair, and this is actually an initiative that came out of discussions that the graduate school had with chancellors at the Morris and Rochester campuses. Uh, Campus-wide, their collegiate and university units are also making efforts to increase graduate education diversity. The Office for Equity and Diversity has the College Made or Multicultural Access Diversity and Excellence Initiative. This provides um, colleges with really important data regarding the diversity of our university community as well as data-driven approaches to increase representative diversity. Um, our colleges and uh, graduate programs are also actively involved in more discipline-specific uh, diversity recruitment uh, initiatives. These uh, utilize a number of different approaches. They include recruitment fellowships, uh, visitation programs here to the university, uh, leadership in national organizations such as the Institute for Mathematics and its applications, and an array of summer research, graduate pro uh, summer research programs that bring undergraduate students from diverse backgrounds from here to Minnesota to conduct research over the summer months. 
Um, and ultimately, our success at uh, increasing graduate student diversity is dependent on increasing the diversity of our faculty as well. And so initiatives in this area include the President's Postdoctoral Fellowship Program, um, collegiate efforts, as well as um, efforts to make sure that our faculty searches recruit the most diverse set of candidates possible and utilize fair and inclusive search processes. And this includes uh, examples such initiatives such as training of search committees in areas such as implicit, uh, implicit bias. The next topic is really focused on climate. And I think uh, to get to this issue, I think it's really important for us to remember that our strategic goal is not focused on recruitment. It's really focused on success of our students from underrepresented populations, um, increasing the diversity of our students that successfully obtain graduate degrees uh, here at Minnesota. So that only means focusing on recruitment, but also making sure that we have a very positive, supportive, and inclusive climate that uh, allows our students to be successful. So in order to meet this goal, we really must have graduate programs and an overall campus that fosters community and inclusive excellence so that all of our students have a productive and rewarding experience that results in successful completion of their graduate training. So again, here at Minnesota, we have a lot of information about this thanks to the Grad Sarah survey. This survey really provides us with an advantage over many of our peer institutions because it gives us really important information about how our students perceive the climate, not only in their program, but also here at the overall campus. So to give you an example of this type of data, this slide shows the range of favorable responses by graduate students on the Twin Cities campus to four questions in Grad Seru that address program and campus climate related, for example, to whether faculty respect students regardless of their background, whether students respect other students regardless of their background, whether faculty encourage expression of diverse viewpoints, and whether students find the overall climate here to be positive and welcoming. And the top set of, uh, of numbers show you that on average, um, at least 89% of our students uh, or above um, exhibit and show favorable responses to those four questions. But again, as Dean Lanyon showed earlier with some other questions from grad students, the range of responses in individual graduate programs is quite broad and variable. So if you look at the overall assessment of climate, that uh, range ranges from uh, an unfortunate low of 18% in one graduate program to 100% of students in another program, indicating that they find the climate positive and welcoming. So clearly we have a lot of additional work to do uh, to create a welcoming, supportive, and inclusive climate for all of our graduate uh, students. The other important thing about that particular survey to mention is that 20% uh, of our grad domestic students are American Indian or students of color. So we still are not a, a terribly diverse graduate student body, but that means that these responses from all of our students are primarily the experiences of majority students here at the university. If we look specifically at American Indian and students of color, the results actually are very similar, but typically about 5% lower in terms of favorable responses for each of those uh, four questions that I showed in the previous slide. So we're taking a number of steps to improve the climate for graduate students across the university. The graduate program actually, the graduate school actually runs the Community of Scholars program. This is a nationally recognized university-wide program that supports the success and retention of Native American graduate students and graduate students of color. We have also started a new graduate student and postdoctoral alliance for diversity and inclusivity. This is a student-led initiative that provides opportunities for all graduate students and postdoctoral scholars to work collaboratively on issues that support diversity and inclusion. We've also recently developed a series of um, videos. These are called Toward Inclusivity Videos. These videos actually share the experiences and viewpoints of University of Minnesota graduate students from diverse backgrounds. And we're also developing a series of specific training resources so that uh, graduate programs, faculty, and staff can engage in efforts to create a more inclusive environment for all. Now, in addition to tracking and continuing to track campus climate with the Grad Series Survey, our Student Conflict Resolution Center also provides us with additional insights through its um, incivility survey. And we are working um, actively to increase the uh, response rate from students from diverse backgrounds so we can get more um, specific information about the um, climate assessment from our students who come from underrepresented groups. And finally, in the graduate school, the graduate school has recently hired a new director. And this director is actually going to be focused on providing direct consultation and advising to colleges and graduate programs as they work to improve the climate for graduate students from diverse backgrounds. Now, all of these graduate student efforts complement a number of different activities 
happening throughout the campus that are focused on improving campus climate. Um, these include the Campus Climate Engagement Team, which emerged in 2014 through the Twin Cities Campus Strategic Planning Process. The Bias Response and Referral Network, which contributes to a welcoming campus climate by responding to reports of bias incidents here on campus. Uh, the President's Initiative to Prevent Sexual Misconduct is a long-term commitment that seeks culture change in order to reduce and prevent sexual misconduct. There are multiple uh, services provided by our Office for Equity and Diversity that work to improve campus climate. This includes, as I mentioned previously, the College Made Initiative, um, the Office of Conflict Resolution, the Z Disability Resource Center, Gender and Sexuality Center, and EOAA. These offices all work to enhance the climate for our graduate students. And although not shown on this slide, I should also mention that our International Student and Scholar Services provides enhanced support for our international graduate students, particularly in light of negative shifts that are occurring with national policies around immigration. Um, this includes a robust orientation to welcome new students to campus, crisis support for current students, uh, training for international students, faculty and staff, and a culture core initiative that provides an opportunity for international students here to internationalize the campus through their own expertise and experience. So all in all, there are many, many initiatives happening at all levels of the institution are aimed at improving uh, campus climate. So I'm going to turn it back over now to Dean Lanyon for the final topic. So the final issue regarding graduate student experience I'd like to mention is that of stress and mental health in graduate education. There's been quite a lot of press about this in recent months. Um, and here's a disturbing quote from uh, the journal Nature Biotechnology. Graduate students are more than six times as likely to experience depression and anxiety as compared to the general population. So what's the situation here at the University of Minnesota? So our 2017 grad SARA results indicate that based on uh, the two-question personal health, health questionnaire screening tool, about 12% of our graduate students who responded to the survey are at risk of major depressive disorder, as compared with around 7% for the general public. And on the right, based on the two-question general anxiety disorder screening tool, 21% of graduate students who responded to the survey are at risk of a general anxiety disorder, as compared with less than 5% of the general public. So these figures from Minnesota are actually lower than what I just told you nationally. Um, and they're actually lower than is true for other institutions that have administered the grad CERO. However, there's no question that these numbers are disturbing. If there's some good news coming out of grad CERO for this, it's that, in fact, um, these same students are more aware of all the resources that are, we have on campus for them than is true nationally. So, which is something that is, very, is somewhat reassuring. But the difficult part in thinking about even how we address this um, is that you have to acknowledge that graduate education itself is stressful. It's a stressful enterprise. And so it's important to sort of think about what that means. So when you think about stress, you have to recognize uh, that there are really two fundamentally different forms of stress, often referred to as positive and negative stress. Positive stress is an essential part of accomplishing great things. In graduate school, it most often results from intellectual challenges that are difficult to overcome, challenges that are an essential part of creating new knowledge and developing innovative ideas. Positive, idea, positive stress actually helps students to become successful scholars. Negative stress is typically the result of things that are ongoing, things that hinder a student's ability to accomplish things. In graduate school, negative stress results from such things as financial, food, and housing insecurity, discrimination, microaggression, and unwelcoming climate, issues that are largely out of the student's control and impact performance daily. Our challenge is to identify the sources of negative stress and to reduce or eliminate these to the extent that we can. Now, it's probably occurred to you that the four issues that we've just talked about are actually sources of negative stress. So if you think about it, if there's a disconnect between the training being received and a student's desire, desired career path, that's going to be stressful. If the student does not have a positive relationship with their advisor, that can be a major source of stress. If a student arrives on campus and finds that in their graduate program they are the sole person of color, the only first generation student, the only disabled student, the only international student, the only female, then stress is very likely. And if a student finds their graduate program department, college, or campus climate unwelcoming, then stress is inevitable. 
So therefore, all the steps that we've talked about so far as solutions to these issues, we hope, will also serve to reduce negative stress and in so doing, reduce anxiety and mental health concerns. So that's our focus. Our, our focus as a graduate school is to try to lower the probability that students will experience serious anxiety and serious um, uh, uh, and develop serious mental health issues as a result of negative interactions. But it's important to recognize that while that's our, our approach to it, the university also is taking steps that if and when students do experience serious anxiety and, and mental health difficulties, that we have resources to assist them. And this is largely through the Office of Student Affairs. Um, they have in, a wide number of things, including increased counseling services now, group therapy, learn to live, let's talk, pause, animal therapy. And for students who have children, um, the Student Parent Help Center. And this is just a small subset of things that are available. And this is what I was referring to when I said students were actually aware of the resources um, that exist on campus. So today, we've communicated several areas where we and our peer institutions have concerns in graduate education, serious concerns. But I definitely don't want to leave you uh, with the impression that graduate education is in need of a complete overhaul. Things, actually, our students are quite happy about many things. We just know that there's room for improvement. So the thing that is core to graduate education is scholarship, right? is, is doing research. And therefore, I wanted to close by giving you an opportunity to hear from one of our outstanding graduate students about his research. And the format we've chosen to use is the three-minute thesis. Three-minute thesis format, it actually was a competition founded by the University of Queensland and is now being held at research universities around the world. We do our own competition at the University of Minnesota. And our presenter today is a winner from the competition held this spring on our Duluth campus. I will invite him up now if he would join us. <laughs> format is the, that the speaker has three minutes and a single slide to communicate the essence of their research to a non-technical audience. Our speaker today is Gil Svai, a student in mechanical and industrial engineering. And he's just come from a job interview, which we think <laughs> went very well. <laughs> Uh, and his title is Tool for Transbronchial Biopsies of Peripheral Lung Nodules. Gillis. Very good. Welcome, Mr. Fire. We always uh, love to welcome uh, bulldogs here, too. So uh, <laughs> you know, we'll make this less stressful in a job interview, I guarantee. It's all yours. Thank you, Chairman McMillan. Um, thank you, Dean Liner. Um, so lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer deaths worldwide. And more people die from lung cancer than colon, breast, and prostate cancers combined. And typically, it is diagnosed through a biopsy of uh, nodules or tiny little masses that have been identified in your lungs um, through a CT scan. And when these nodules are centrally located <coughs> within your lungs, um, they can send a standard bronchoscope down your airway or transbronchially and obtain a sample for, for the testing. The problem comes when they are located at the periphery of the lungs where the standard bronchoscope is too large to navigate to where the bronchioles become really tiny. And one of the methods used out there to uh, perform those type of biopsies uh, is shown on figure A. It's the transthoracic needle biopsy where the doctor pokes the needle through your chest to obtain a sample. The drawback with that is if that little hole created by the needle doesn't seal quickly, your lungs collapse. It could be partial, it could be full. A full collapse of the lungs, um, it's a symptom we call pneumothorax, and it leads to longer stay in the hospital, which is costly for both the payer and the facility. And so there's a need to perform more of these biopsies through a transbronchial approach by sending the probe down your airway. Another method out there that's able to perform just that is um, shown in figure B, is the endobronchial navigation bronchoscopy um, from Medtronic. That system is drawback. back, it's, it's very expensive. And so that's where our research comes in. We sought out to find a way to perform these peripheral lung biopsies without the risk of pneumothorax associated with the transthoracic needle and also without the expense of the ENB systems. And our proposed solution shown in figure C incorporates um, a compact arrangement of uh, light, camera, and ultrasound probe. And we also designed a flexible needle that could be deployed adjacent such that it can perform biopsy in the um, tissue that's in the ultrasound field of view. Um, and so after several design iterations, uh, figure D was the final prototype 
that would be uh, validated through uh, some benchtop and animal testing. Um, the device was terrible and we were able to use it with uh, the existing ultrasound probes in, in the hospital. Um, figure E shows you the tip of the device in an angulated position and just figure F is just how easy some of those, uh, the, the angulation mechanism shows just how easy the angulation mechanism was affected. It's just two wires um, weaved in a bending section such that when you lengthen one while shortening the other one, the two bends. And then the last two figures at the uh, bottom right of the slide that show you the bench top and animal testing. Um, I had an undergraduate research assistant that uh, designed the 2D model of the lungs that was transparent such that we could use gelatin to mimic lung tissue and then test the ability of that device to navigate to that location and then deploy the needle and obtain a sample. One of the big questions we sought to answer during animal testing was if that coaxial arrangement in the proposed solution can provide enough illumination for, for the device to navigate. And figure H shows you a video image obtained during animal testing. We used the swine model, which uh, happens to be the model that was used to test some of the uh, more sophisticated ENB systems. And our bill of materials for this device, minus the existing ultrasound probes, was just under $80. And, it put a, and this device can be built cheap and disposable. And just to give you a sense of uh, uh, numbers, in 2013, the Center for Medicare and Medicare Services paid for over 43,000 um, transthoracic lung biopsies versus um, over 46,000 um, transbronchial biopsies. But with the addition of a tool like this in the market, you'll be moving a lot of those numbers from the transthoracic biopsies up to the transbronchial approach, which is more comfortable for patients. Thank you. Very good. Well, thank you. And uh, let's uh, jump right into questioning here. I'm afraid to ask you any questions because I'm not sure I could uh, frame up a good one, but uh, that's fascinating. Um, Regent Beeson, and I've got Regent Powell and Regent Simonson. Some more coming. Well, uh, thank you, presenters. Uh, this academic year has been uh, a series of really good presentations on graduate education, and, um, and it's been delivered well uh, and effectively. The, um, Going back to the the um, issue of career counseling and the, I'm wondering whether we have enough counselors who've had business experience, who've been in the business world, you know, since half the master's students want to go places other than academic advising. Um, do we have, do we recruit from the private sector to get uh, folks into those positions, or do they just sort of migrate up from student counsel, counsel advising into career counseling? And you could answer that. Vice Regent, Provost Lanyon, Regent Beeson, Chair McMillan, members of the board. Um, of course, as is typical, I, and by now you should know this, um, my answer is going to be it depends. Um, every program is doing something slightly different here. Uh, but I'm going to give you a couple of examples. One, the uh, university's alumni association has something that they've developed called the Maroon and Gold Network. This is an effort to uh, identify alumni who would be willing to talk to current students and then to pair them current students up. And so that's one way of handling this is to um, be able to have students identify the career path they're interested in and then look amongst our alumni to find people who actually have, are in those positions. So that's one way that the, that the uh, Alumni Association is uh, pursuing this. Um, individual programs, uh, I mentioned to you that we are trying to work with the Alumni Association, the University Foundation, and others to find out where all of our graduate alumni are and their current employers. Um, we're doing a survey. The idea is to eventually get in the hands of graduate programs a list of their alumni who are in different disciplines that they can then connect their current students with. Very good. Thank you. Um, Jim Powell. Thanks, Chair McMillan, and thank you, presenters, and thanks for the good work you're doing to support our graduate students who are so important to the institution. So I have a question, uh, two questions. One is on just sort of the economics of graduate education, because it, it's a long haul. 
and it's expensive. And so I'm just wondering if we, if we sort of, if we track kind of the data that we do for undergrads as well and just the percentage who actually complete the degree, the length of time it takes, um, the indebtedness, which I, I, I think I recall, you know, that graduate student indebtedness is a really significant percentage of total student indebtedness. And so I'm interested in that because, and also can we, if we have those metrics, can we compare them to peer institutions? Um, just to get a sense for how, you know, how well we're moving folks through the stream. So I'm interested in that information and, and cause I think among the stressors is, I mean, it's, it's economically, it's, 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 it's stressful. So that's, that's the first question. And then the other question is for Mr. Mr. Fye and congratulations on, you know, your work. I'm wondering if, um, you know, if you created intellectual property and if so, how, t maybe you can tell us a little bit about how, the technology commercialization you know, team at the university have supported you, you know, as you've tried to, as you develop that IP and got it ready for licensing or whatever it is what you're going to do with you know, that probe. Mr. Fai, let's start with you, and then we can go to our other presenters. Well, thank you, Regent Paul. Um, so the intellectual property team, team here at the um, main campus was very helpful along the, the whole way. Right now we are... Um, at the level of uh, uh, maybe licensing and commercialization, um, after having gone through uh, animal testing, we've kind of uh, um, taken out some of the huge risks uh, that are associated with such such a taking such a device into market. So right now we do have a intellectual property out, and yeah, we're at the level of maybe licensing and mass production. Congratulations. Thank you. Agreed. Uh, Vice Provost Lanyon or Associate Dean Chimizu on, on Regent Powell's other question about the economics of uh, graduate school. So, th Regent Powell, thank you for this uh, question. Um, I'll actually suggest that at some point we might uh, want to look back at some, one of the presentations of the fall where I've got some of those figures for you, but I can summarize them, I think, pretty quickly. Um, our PhD students, the vast majority of our PhD students are actually supported. Um, because they're t uh, teaching assistants or they're research assistants or they're on fellowships, okay? So our PhD students tend not to graduate with much, if any, more debt as a result of graduate education. It's different in masters. And even there it varies. So um, many of our master students are supported, but it's a lower percentage being te teaching assistants or, or research assistants. Um, there has been increased uh, press recently about uh, massive debt for people pursuing um, uh, post-baccalaureate degrees. It's tended to be actually the for-profit institutions that have been driving that um, and encouraging students to take out loans and so on. Um, the, the situation at research universities has been that if the debt that a student has after getting their advanced degree, most of that is actually from undergraduate debt, not from additional graduate debt. That's sort of the national picture. That said, the one thing I would really like to focus on when it comes to student debt is that increasingly, as our undergraduate students are graduating with more debt, their willingness to consider going for another degree is declining. And that's especially true for students from underrepresented populations. So it's a real issue that we need to be aware of. And it is actually ending up being yet another hurdle uh, that we have to face when trying to increase diversity of students getting advanced degrees. Thank you. Uh, Regent Simonson. Thank you, Chair McMillan. Thank you, uh, presenters. Um, I have the honor and privilege of having a graduate degree from the university. My major advisor and mentor, as I looked at him, was originally from Sri Lanka. We still have a relationship today, and, and I can, it changed my life. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very thankful for that, for that opportunity. Uh, that said, a kind of, um, couple of points here, um, kind of follow up on Regent Beeson, uh, what, what he had to say about uh, experienced uh, faculty, experienced uh, uh, adjunct or getting externships, that kind of thing. I know that was an issue with me when I went right out. I went non-academic, went right into industry. It took me a long time to uh, find out what, even though I have the technical background, how to apply it. Right. 
and and uh, and I've hired into my businesses multiple grad students from bachelors to masters to to PhDs to professionals in my business over time, and the same story it hasn't changed much over the years. So it's something I think that still needs to be considered. It might be the area I'm in, but I've hired people out of different colleges, and I don't see a lot of difference. So I don't think it's something that should be overlooked. I think it could really begin with. Especially, I know one situation in one department at one college that uh, they hired a person that had several years' experience in industry, and he has made a big difference in that. Uh, you know, he just didn't go out of academia to academia. So it's something that I think is good. So with all that said, uh, the other thing is I really appreciate this graduate student experience <coughs> uh, survey. Uh, I don't think he had that when I was there. No. <laughs> and I don't know how long you've been doing it, but my first thought uh, is... Uh, generational experiences. <clears throat> you know, I had a TA, I had an RA, so I'd, I'd had that during the week. I'd do my, go to classes during the week, I'd do my research during the week and at night, and then Friday night to Sunday night, I'm out shoeing horses to make a living. Um, I don't know if there's a generational difference here that we're seeing in this, and it leading to health and stress also. Uh, I, maybe I haven't done it long enough, so. Vice Provost Lanyon. Regent Simonson, thanks very much. Um, RadServe has only been in existence since 2017. Um, we are one of only two institutions, I think, that have done it twice now. Our intent is to do it every other year. Um, one of the other things that will do is force graduate students to take it multiple times, which they probably won't necessarily like, but it is the, the best way we have of, of enabling graduate students to provide us with anonymous feedback. Remember what I said, this relationship between faculty and graduate students is really crit critical. Um, students are very dependent on their advisor, so they are somewhat hesitant to give their advisor honest feedback if it's negative. GradServe is a mechanism for us to get at, at, as best we can to protect students if they wish to give us some really valuable information. We're going to start getting that on uh, a regular basis, and we'll be able, in the case of PhD students, to have the same student give us feedback two or three times during the course of their development, right? Um, and ultimately, this sort of longitudinal information, how are things changing, will come out of the survey. And I want to go back to something else you said about this idea of uh, how do we get different expertise into graduate education. Um, we're exploring a, a new model right now at the University of Minnesota. Um, the challenge for graduate programs is that this isn't a situation where students are either going on to be faculty or they're doing this one other thing. Instead, some students are interested in faculty positions, some are interested in, in this kind of nonprofit, some in this kind of industry position, the government. <clears throat> it's all over the map, which means that no graduate program can really bring in all of the expertise that the full range of students need. So where I think, or we think, at Minnesota, graduate education needs to go is to become a partnership between the graduate program and the broader university and in fact state community, where the graduate program is really providing the disciplinary knowledge and skills that are necessary to, to be a real researcher scholar in that area. But the other entities, the university, the broader community, is actually being brought in as an active player to help with this other professional development piece that's relevant to the, that student's particular career goal. That's, good. That's a culture change for higher education, but it's time. And I mentioned that uh, we hope to be part of an AAU uh, Association of American Universities initiative in this space. That's exactly what that's about, is to try to move us in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Kraft. Thank you, Chair McMillan, and thank you, presenters, and Mr. Fai, for, um, for the presentation. I um, have a couple of brief comments and then uh, two questions. Um, First, um, I appreciate and students appreciate the um, incorporation of mental health into the presentation. Um, the numbers are always jarring to look at, and um, this being a topic of the recent student report, um, we appreciate the attention being drawn to it, um, as well as the interconnectedness of um, b b between these issues, say between campus climate, sense of belonging, yeah. and, rep and representation, um, and student. Uh, mental health here for uh, graduate students. 
uh, in the presentation. My first question is um, on the methodology of the grad, um, the, the graduate uh, grad survey. I had noticed um, in, in this, um, taking into account the relative youth of the survey, um, I don't know how much you can speak to this, but the um, there's a category, a campus wild card um, on the slides, and I'm wondering, I mean, if I'm interpreting that correctly, by the nature of it, it can't be compared across institutions, so I'm wondering how, the, what kind of questions are, is the university asking of its graduate students through that? Great, Representative Kraft, that's a great question. I didn't want to go into all the detail of Grad Zero, but I love going into the detail of Grad Zero. Um, so there's a core module that every institution administers. There are some optional modules like professional development, health and well-being, international module that institutions can choose to do. Um, of course, recognize each one of these additional modules means more questions and more time as you're uh, responding to the survey. But the last piece is the one you pointed out, the wild card, which is actually, I think, a brilliant move on the part of the consortium. There are, that's an opportunity for each campus to put in their own specific questions that aren't comparable across. Mm -hmm. Um, the reason it's so, uh, so important is that there are some institutions that actually have been doing their own surveys for a while. This provides an opportunity for them to agree to do Grad Cero, but keep the, the questions that, that are unique that they've been doing for a few years and to put in there. But it's also a mechanism where each of the campuses are beginning to test questions that ultimately may go into the main part of Grad Cero. So yes, any question that's in the wildcard module is by definition not comparable at, in, uh, when it's first administered. Ultimately, our hope is that that's where we're testing some new ideas. Representative Kraft, you have a quick follow-up? Yes, thank you, Chair McMillan. Um, a quick follow-up, just um, a question related to employment growth, and this can be made brief just by a, a question of whether um, another measurement is being made. Um, with This was with the 17% um, projected growth um, for um, as associated with employment in master's level occupations and 13% corresponding to doctoral um, slash professional. Um, are there also measure, is um, the program also um, measuring the um, rate of, in, of um, influx of students into these programs so that it's um, not, th th that the program isn't getting into a situation where there's this um, disproportionate influx of students into programs that um, would lead to a sort of mismatch between um, how rapidly the, the job field is expanding compared to the enrollment. Uh, Representative Kratt, yes. Um, you've touched on a very interesting question here. Um, one is, um, if I can extend what you're asking, we aren't necessarily very good higher ed broadly in um, responding quickly to societal need for new degrees. I'd say that that's something that is something that the university, all universities are really now struggling with trying to figure that out. It's especially true in what we would call the professional master space, where there's new ideas, new, new needs uh, out there. Um, the enrollment in each of these programs is decided locally, right? So there's no central management of, of um, graduate enrollment that's done locally, and it's typically based on some combination of um, the demand that, in terms of the number of applications, um, some knowledge of the employment uh, prospects of students, um, as well as the need um, for research assistance and so on, so it's some combination of those things. Um, but this gets back to Regent Simonson's question. My own personal view is that <coughs> If programs um, wish to, if programs are admitting large number of students, those are probably programs that should be providing a wide variety of professional development opportunities so that they're really preparing students for a wide diversity of careers. If a program is preparing students only to be faculty, most disciplines, that's going to be, should be a relatively small number because there aren't, you know, that, that's not an ever-increasing uh, uh, job market. So I think that there is an effort to make sure that graduate programs are right-sized. It's complicated because it's a really moving target, and it's done locally. Thank you. 
All right, uh, we've got uh, Regent Her, and then we're going to close with Regent Sherwood. Okay, right. Um, maybe two questions. One is that um, I do see the GradServe as an excellent retention tool. Um, so my question then is what about the students that have decided to not continue uh, one way or the other? Does, does the survey capture their um, thoughts, satisfaction, dissatisfaction? Why did they leave um, and how's that impacted? So that's one. Two is that uh, with regards to recruitment, um, I'm wondering, and this could be follow up uh, around the equity lens. So I do see the numbers for African American and Asian American, but what is the gender breakdown? And then what is the Asian between the different ethnic groups? What are the percentages in light of in light of Minnesota demographics. So for example, I'm Hmong American. I know that for female Hmong Americans during the 2010 census, and hopefully that number has gone up, but for graduate um, or higher degree for Hmong women was 3%. And are we making headways and are we tracking those numbers? And then my third question that I'm really concerned about, and it leads to the natural progression of what your discussion is with regards to uh, retention, uh, recruitment, and that is placement. Um, when I graduated law school, I had to take the bar exam. And I know that for many of my uh, people, students of color peers, a lot of them did not pass it the first time. Um, maybe because of the way the test was set up, maybe not adequate preparation. Uh, plus you have to pay money to take the bar review course. So, and I know that when I worked at the state council, we had a lot of issues with regards to people who graduate from masters of social work and getting them licensed so that they can provide the mental health services in the field. So are we tracking placement um, and tracking placement among all the demographics? And then is that leading us towards policy positions? Vice Provost Lanyon, there's a couple questions there. So. I'll try to remember them. Uh, Regent Her, thank you very much. Um, first grad, Saru, uh, or, or surveys. Um, surveys are only administered to our enrolled students. Um, we, and that's not the only survey. We also have a doctoral exit survey that's administered, but only to students who get their degree. It's a, it's a big gap. We do not currently have um, a, a tool in place to ask students who leave without getting a degree uh, for their feedback. Um, it has been attempted by other institutions without success trying to get people to respond to a survey who've just said, I don't want anything to do with your institution, if that's the attitude. It can be difficult, but, but I don't think that's a reason to not keep trying. So, so just note that that's on our radar screen um, as something that we really would like to figure out. So that's one. Um, in terms of placement, um, placement information um, is not um, gathered centrally at the university. As I indicated, one of the goals uh, for the graduate school in concert with some other units on campus would be to try to find where all of our graduate alumni are and how they're employed. Um, that said, um, there are many units that do a great job of it. So many graduate programs really do know where all their their uh, alumni are, um, but it's highly varied. And I think that's actually part of the difficulty in uh, changing culture in universities uh, around career path diversity. Programs that actually know where all their alumni are tend to do a better job of being aware of where their alumni are going and therefore trying to help them uh, be successful across that full range. Programs that aren't aware of their um, uh, alumni's career paths tend to still be thinking that they're training people for faculty positions. What was your other one? Sorry. Oh, uh, with regards to recruitment, uh, the gender and equity Sorry. lines. So um, we, uh, we do have information at the program level um, for um, a variety of information about uh, self-reported. 
as students applied, filled out their application, if they reported uh, socioeconomic status, whether they were first generation, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual identity, sexual orientation, if, it's, if they gave it to us, it's there. Um, and we can access it. However, it's um, for, for example, uh, different uh, eight groups of Asian people, we don't have that information. That's not the way we're collecting data at the university currently. Um, it is a topic that we have been having within our diversity office with the Office of Equity and Diversity about is it time to think about sort of changing what, um, what options we provide um, as part of the application process. And the last thing I'll say is that um, there is some concern that uh, students may choose, applicants may choose not to provide information as part of the application process, thinking that it might actually impact the application process. Something that we'd very much like to do is figure out a way to go back to students once they've matriculated here and say, oh, by the way, this is the information we have in the system. If you would like to update it, we would love for you to do that. Uh, so we have somewhat incomplete information as well. Okay? Thank you. All right, Regent Shu, take us uh, home on this topic. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair McMillan. Thank you, presenters. Um, I just want to note that uh, I was I was a little bit surprised that uh, at the list of um, this is on page uh, 65 that shows that uh, we are 14th in terms of national ranking uh, with 678 total. Uh, doctorate, doctorate recipients in 2017. I was wondering if anything has changed since 2017, uh, whether we're moving up or down. Um, and I also note that outside of the uh, Big Ten, if you take out California and the Texas schools, uh, it's really just uh, the Big Ten, uh, Florida, Harvard, and uh, I think that's pretty interesting um, to look at. Um, so I don't know if you want to answer that real quick, or if you can. Yes, reason should. Yeah, Vice Provost Lanyon. Um, one, I'll point out that if, if you have the, still have the handouts from some of the presentations in the fall, you'll see that our number of PhDs and where we rank changed since the last time I talked to you about it, because that's the kind of volatility that's here. I think we were more like fifth or sixth nationally. Fifth? Regent Powell, very good. <laughs> well, I was going to, that's a good question, because yeah. I, I remembered five. Yeah. So it, it changes uh, over time. Uh, we are consistently um, high here. That, that's the current figures for you. Um, I don't, I wouldn't say there's a trend there yet, anyway, at least not that I would, uh, that, that's clear. Um, it is interesting, and I think it's important for, uh, you know, Board of Regents to just recognize that the company we keep in the Big Ten Big Ten are great institutions and are really um, have a huge impact in terms of um, the influence we have in higher ed in North America. And I think the fact that we are part of this Big Ten Academic Alliance, the more we can capitalize on that and share ideas and so on, which we do all the time, um, is really wonderful. These are our peers, um, and uh, there are many things that we are currently doing to help each other and many more that I think we can do in the future. Well, follow up? Yes. Uh, well, thank you for that. And thank you for that. <laughs> oh, I, I did think we were doing better than that. I thought we were in the top 10. Mm -hmm. um, it, it does give me a little bit of angst to see the number one ranking here goes to University of Wisconsin Madison. And uh, I hope we're catching uh, up with them. Uh, I, I was um, pleased to see your. Um, I was a little shocked, actually, to see your mental health um, analysis on this. And um, I was wondering uh, if uh, there are things that, um, well, I would just say that hopefully we're doing, I think you said we're doing better than the national numbers, which is good. Uh, hopefully we're finding ways to do better than that. Uh, and then on the diversity, uh, it looks like we're making a little bit of progress over the last four or five years. It's a couple percent, it's not huge. Um, and maybe that's maybe for a few future discussion. <coughs> but um, one thing I thought was I was expecting and I didn't see in here was to see kind of of all of our programs, you know, which ones are actually doing, which ones are actually on the right side. And I was expecting to, for you to name some names and I didn't get that. So <laughs> don't know if you can do Re that. 
Regent Hsu, the right side of? Uh, the, the, uh, you showed a chart. I don't think we have it in here, just about the, um, the, yeah, the horizontal one with the um, meaningless uh, vertical from right. axis. Right. I don't think we yes. have it in our I don't think that, I think that's right. document materials, but you mentioned it. And I was just wondering what yeah. some of those programs were on the, the right side of that. Regent Hsu, thank you. Provost Lanyon. Uh, so the, the interesting thing, the, the most important finding in some ways from Grad Cero is that uh, there are lots of questions in Grad Cero and climate and diversity and so on. Every program has areas where they're outstanding and every program has some areas where they have room for improvement. So pro programs aren't consistently on one side of that line, if you will. Uh, and that's the great thing about a survey tool like this. Most institutions aren't collecting this kind of information. And when they do, it's generally at the campus level or maybe at the college level. And it's really hard to do much with that. Uh, this tool uh, allows us to look at the program level, what's the satisfaction level of students in each individual program? And that's information that we've been talking with deans about um, and talking with individual directors of graduate studies. And I think one of the reasons we see saw an increase in the response rate this most recent time we administered the survey is in part because students are actually seeing that filling out survey results in change, that changes are happening at the graduate program level and the college level in response to these. All right, we are, uh, we've, I gotta wrap it up, uh, Regent Hsu. I just Shui. feel like he's holding out on me here. Uh, oh, <laughs> let's, I've got a couple more regions too. We don't have, we're down to half an hour before we have to stop. So thank you presenters. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Fai, good luck to you in the employment and the technology development commercialization world. So um, we have action items as well after the next item, and uh, I think most of our regents need to be on the road to uh, an evening regential function tonight, so uh, 4.45 is our, our wrap-up time. So I'd invite the presenters up now. We are not gonna take a formal break if uh, members of the board need to uh, Grab a, a refreshment or M&Ms going back and do so, but we're going to plow through here. So, or we will never finish on time. So I'd invite uh, Professor uh, Mortimer and Associate Vice Provost uh, Maline to the, to the table. And uh, let's see, are you going to provide any intro remarks here? Please, uh, Provost Hanson. Thanks, um, Chair McMillan and members of the board. This agenda item grew out of a discussion with you and other members of the board as we considered new topics that might be of particular interest to the board. We're all aware of the social construction of distinctive generational profiles. Mm -hmm. Greatest generation, maybe that was just a Tom Brokaw construction, but um, the silent generation, boomers, Gen X, millennials, Gen Z, sometimes also called iGen um, because of their ties to their smartphones. <laughs> well, well, students of, of many ages are currently found on all our campuses, and the characterization of any individual uh, is simply in terms of generational stereotypes is likely inapt and possibly offensive. There surely are different formative social experiences at different periods of history. Thus, for this last presentation, um, we want to talk about generational changes in students and discuss some ways in which today's entering students, Gen Z or the iGen, might, as a group, be compared with earlier generations. I want to assure you that the university is alert to generational changes, among other demographic changes, and tries to adjust its services and approaches to education in order to meet our ever-changing populations of students. To do this, we've asked two colleagues from the Twin Cities campus to talk with you today. Jalen Mortimer is a professor of sociology and an accomplished scholar in the area of life course pathways and intergenerational dynamics. Her 30-year, three-generational youth development study has generated more than 200 papers and publications. And she's joined by Leanne Moline, Associate Vice Provost for Student Success. Dr. Moline works uh, in undergraduate education here on the Twin Cities campus, providing central leadership and coordination for student support areas, such as academic advising, learning support services, and other programs. So I would invite Professor Mortimer to begin. Hey, thank Welcome. you very much, Provost uh, Hansen. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak to you today. 
Uh, I'd just like to make a, a few brief comments uh, first about the popular discourse on generations and how most serious scholars uh, of youth and transition to adulthood do not place very much stock in this because, uh, you know, you've all heard these terms, uh, the boomerang, I mean, the, <laughs> the baby boomers and the uh, millennial generation and uh, sometimes uh, Gen Zs, Gen Y, the iGen. Um, these uh, labels are bandied around. They're often very inconsistent definitions of them. Uh, often inconsistent kinds of attributes are uh, used to describe them. So you hear that millennials are both uh, the me generation and pro-social. Uh, and of course, there's tremendous heterogeneity uh, within each of these, uh, you know, large cohorts and. Uh, and, and, and so uh, I sort of view some of these labels with <laughs> some uh, disdain. Uh, however, of course, there have been uh, tremendous societal changes over the past uh, several decades that have changed the nature of uh, the student uh, experience. Uh, Provost Hansen mentioned uh, the youth development study, which I've been engaged in for uh, now over 30 years. And this has given me an opportunity to really uh, look at and understand differences between uh, generations, starting off with a, a group of students who were attending the St. Paul Public Schools in the, uh, in the 80s and uh, surveying them, following them over quite a long period of time. The last survey was done when they were 37 and 38 years old, so uh, from adolescence through transition to adulthood into adulthood, and we're currently surveying them uh, now at the age of 45 and 46. And those surveys are just going out this, uh, this summer. It's a three-generation study because we also have surveyed their parents and their children. And uh, importantly, when we started studying their children, they were about the same age as the parents were when we started studying them. So we've really been able to look at uh, changes across generations, uh, how parents help their children to be successful, and differences across adolescent generations in the same family. And I don't have a lot of time to tell you about this. I certainly couldn't give a, a three-minute <laughs> synopsis of this research, but if any of you have interest in it, I'd be very happy to uh, tell you about it, maybe if we have time for some questions. Certainly, there have been changes in the societal context that have affected uh, students uh, today. We all know about the increasing uh, inequality of uh, wealth and income, the hollowing out of the middle class, changing occupational structure, uh, large increases in professional and managerial occupations, uh, then increases also in the lower level service uh, industries, uh, declines in manufacturing, the retail sector, um, and uh, a lot of change in families, largely as a result of these uh, broader economic trends, more families experiencing uh, economic stress, uh, more non-intact uh, families. And another trend that I've been very interested in that hasn't been given so much attention, but some attention in the media, are the declining opportunities for teenagers to work when I started my study, practically all the students uh, in high school were employed, and uh, today it's, uh, it's much less. Wow. And I think this is problematic because working gives students an opportunity to get into the labor force and to learn about uh, what it's like to work and the value of money and all these kinds of uh, experiences that provide an impetus to thinking about what kinds of work they would want to do and helps them to uh, grow up. People are taking longer now to transition to adulthood. They're spending more time in education, uh, experiencing more lengthy school to work transition. Uh, they're slower to gain economic uh, self-sufficiency. They're forming families, marrying and having children at older ages, not the early 20s so much, but more the mid to late 20s or early 30s. <clears throat> they have longer dependence on their parents. We hear the term boomerang children, those who 
leave home and then come back to live with their uh, parents. And, and all of these trends are interrelated because if children are taking longer to establish themselves as adults, that means that uh, parents feel more responsible for their children over a longer period of time because the children don't have their own uh, families to, uh, to rely on. And, and youth are closer to their parents. They communicate more with them and uh, we, we often you know, hear about students and, uh, who are uh, talking to their parents multiple times uh, a day, whereas in previous generations it was more like maybe the once a week uh, phone call that was seen as uh, kind of obligatory. Uh, a, <laughs> a, a, a little cart cartoon here. Of course, there's a lot of cultural ambivalence about these trends because we would hope that our children would be uh, Independence. So this is uh, someone obviously in a dorm room saying, yes, mother, I told you I'm doing fine on my own at college. Hey, could you log on and find my schedule, order my books, and call me when it's uh, time for class? And uh, so, so, you, so you see there is some ambivalence there. <clears throat> so we've seen a steep increase in the numbers of young people attending college. Uh, around 1970, only about 10% had college degrees, and now uh, about 35% do. We have many more first-generation students as a result of the fact that uh, this expansion has occurred, and much more diverse student bodies than in previous generations. So more students are coming from uh, lower-income families. Uh, there are more minority students. Uh, more older students who uh, you know, may start college and then they stop and then they come back, and, uh, and, and changes in gender. Uh, up until about 1990, there were more men than women attending college. And then in 1991, we saw a crossover where women exceeded men for the first time, and now women are receiving the majority of bachelor's, master's, and uh, doctoral degrees. The inequalities in society are reflected in the uh, college student experience. <clears> that some parents are providing tremendous support for their children financially, uh, you know, residentially. Uh, they're providing advice and a lot of emotional support uh, through all these text messages and phone calls and so on. And uh, our research indicates that. This kind of help really does uh, enable students to graduate and graduate on time. <clears throat> but there are a lot of other parents who really can't help their children in any of these ways. And, uh, and, and uh, so on the one hand, you find students who have uh, ample support and get allowances from their parents and so on, and other students who are working very long hours just to kind of keep themselves going. Uh, nationally, about one out of five students work students in college work full-time, and about half work uh, part-time, you know, in addition. And so, uh, you know, these are students who are working very hard. Another very kind of ominous trend that I've heard about is that, you know, some uh, students who are coming from very poor backgrounds are actually using their earnings in college to help their parents or using their, their fellowship support. And so we have these tremendous uh, differences uh, and, and then uh, food insecurity, homelessness, and so on. Now, all of this is reflected in, I think, uh, increasing student anxiety. Uh, they're worried about being able to get into this expanding professional and managerial uh, class. Uh, sometimes students tell me that they think that in order to stand out and to uh, ensure a stable uh, standard of living, that they uh, really have to even get more than the college degree, that they have to get a master's degree or a, a PhD or a law degree. Uh, and so they're, they're worried about their grades, they're worried about getting into the next level of uh, higher education, they're worried about getting into work, uh, paying off their debts, becoming economically self-sufficient given their uh, loan obligations. And, and then there are all these societal issues, many of which we've uh, seen for a very long time, but they uh, are getting a whole lot of attention and they seem to be always in our, our face, and some of them are fairly uh, new. So 
you know, racism, discrimination with us a long time, but then uh, issues of safety. Uh, I think that students who were attending college in the 70s didn't worry that a gunman would come into the class and uh, start shooting, and we have uh, many incidents of shootings on campus now. Um, sexual harassment, uh, climate change, a fairly new source of anxiety, but again, not on students' radar in previous generations that they might have to experience wildfires and droughts and, and, and so forth. So I think, uh, and as a faculty member, I've been teaching at the university ever since 1974, and uh, I've seen changes in my students. I've seen uh, students who are needing help and uh, seeking uh, these disability accommodations, but they were much more rare in previous uh, eras <laughs> uh, and, and seemed to be more related in an earlier period, and maybe Leanne can speak more to this, uh, related to physical disabilities. So it had students who were blind and deaf and requiring uh, sign interpreters in, in the classroom and so on. Uh, but now the students needing uh, accommodation and having letters of accommodation from the disability office are more likely to be uh, suffering from mental health issues and especially uh, anxiety uh, disorder. And, and some of this too is reflected in uh, student dropout when the anxieties and the problems become so great that they just feel they can't uh, stay in school any longer. Uh, nationally, of those who start four-year college programs, only 55% actually finish in six years with their degrees. Uh, the University of Minnesota, I'm happy to say, is doing uh, better, but this is still a, uh, a problem. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Leon. Great. Um, so there's many ways the university is responding to these changes, and not only having worked here for a long time, but the parents of two of these Generation Z kids, um, I do experience this on a regular basis. Um, so I want to highlight some of the examples, um, and coming from the lens of the Twin Cities campus, since that's been my experience, but I'm sure we could kind of probably assume that these are experienced the same way on the other campuses. So as we refer to, you know, on this campus, we've invested in student success, and we've done a really good job with that. And we've seen now the highest four-year graduation rate that we've experienced on this campus at 71%. And that's an increase of 47.5% over the past 20 years. So we are doing the right things, and I think responding to students kind of in three main ways that, um, that really impact all the, the areas that you see here on this slide. The first is that the, this generation looking for an increased demand for individualized services. So they want to have high touch and customized services. They have a lot of pressure on their time, so they want to make sure the services they receive are relevant to them as individuals. Mm -hmm. um, we see the expectations that services are available when and how they need them. So this 24-7 Google accessible kind of information mm -hmm. that they would like to see that same kind of service as they come to campus. So we think about our services maybe not so much as just what kind of appointments we can have and one-to-one -one interactions, but what is the drop-in model? What is the online response? What is the ways that we can re you know, relate to students in different ways and even adapting to the 24-7 mentality by some of the crowdsourcing of, of our resources? And finally, we see the delay in adulting coming, kind of playing out and that students expect more structure, more guidance, and, and clear expectations. And so we've made some of that shift in recent years with now expecting full-time attendance. Um, we are now welcoming our class of 2023, so that's an identity that we really put out there for students to understand that it's a four-year expectation and that we'll align our policies and practices to help support them in that way. And that's an important message as I talk to parents and students at orientation, that they hear that the university is behind them with that four-year helping to guide their path. You've heard a little bit about some of these other topics and I think some of the other agenda items that you've had as, a, as regents, so I'll try to skim through these to help save on some of the time for the, for the board meeting. Um, but Dr. Mortimer talked about the inequity of society and how students show up on this campus and how that plays out. And we do see around 43% of our graduating students don't need financial assistance, while about 57% do. So that creates an inequity on our campus. There are students that are really thinking about this, working more hours, working harder to make ends meet, and some students who don't have to. Um, and we think about that affordability and how we structure our environment. So we not only have made great increases in our, in our need-based aid, and I think I've really moved the dial in how we package students and support them in getting here, but we've also worked on like how do we make the experience, the full experience of the university accessible to all students. 
So when we think about high impact practices, we want students to be able to have those experiences that make them ready for their career choice and to have that learning, deep learning and development. We also want to make sure that they can afford then to, um, to, have, to study abroad, to have a research opportunity, to have internships. And so we've worked to really scholarship those opportunities as best we can and to provide those additional access points so all students can have equal access to that. But we also need to acknowledge that we have, that, again, the food and housing insecurity, and that is, uh, that Dr. Mortimer's brought up, is that not, is a reality on this campus. And I think you've heard in a re previous presentation that about 17% of our students identify, identify as food insecure. And so we've taken steps in terms of a food pantry that we offer once a month now, the Swipe Out Hunger, where meals are donated for other students to be able to pick up if they're in need. Emergency grants, some of our students are one flat tire away from not being able to make it on campus. Um, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Programs, the SNAP program, how to align those for students who are on campus currently. And we, and we have also now a basic needs coalition, so a group of about 35 offices or staff and faculty representing different areas that come together to talk about these basic needs and how really to kind of connect the, got, the dots in terms of all the different supports that we can provide. We see that with the diversification of the different uh, students coming to campus that the sense of belonging is important for all students. We know that makes a difference in their retention and graduation. Um, we, we know that this, well, you see, I guess, anecdotally, this generation having a harder time making some of those connections face to face. Our, my colleagues in Housing and Residence Life have talked about focusing more energy on how to help students um, be able to have those interactions and really help them make those personal connections. So they talk about the 2D world they live on their screen and the 3D world they live in, the, in relating to other students in the residence halls. And as we think about the diversity of the population, we have one in four of our students here as first generation. We have 18% low income. And so we think about providing a supportive campus climate for, the, for those students. And what that means often is that the services we provide are not one size fits all. We need to approach these from an equity minded, with equity minded strategies and be able to take into account the unique needs that these students bring in order to be, help, be able to help them be successful. Parent and family support. I think we hear a lot about that in the media and that certainly is happening on campus. We see um, increased involvement in uh, parents and students' lives and coming at it from a place of partnership. They're, they're becoming more friends and mentors in their relationship, that common, you know, they're their first go-to. If a student is having an issue, it's usually mom or dad that they're checking in with. Um, and so we view them as partners. We tried to resist for a while, it didn't work. Now we're viewing them as partners in this journey as how we can all together support students. Um, back in the early 90s when we did parent orientation, we had about 40 to 60 parents uh, attend in the day. We are now up to 250 to 300 a day. And so we saw this last year, about 5,500 families, family members attend parent orientation, which is about 63% of students bringing family members. Um, and we do know it, it contributes to their success when their parents attend uh, parent orientation. Mm -hmm. We have a vast array of other programs that are offered through our parent and family program, including Parent and Family Weekend with over 1,000 1, visitors attending. We have a special event for parents of first generation students and we celebrate their pride as a family as they have their students start at the university. We have websites, calendars, we even have the office staff who are one-on-one -on -one consultations with parents um, as they call in and ask about what can I do with my student, with some well-being concerns, even how does my student make friends and can you help us with that. Um, I was just visiting our students and parents in China that are coming onto campus and that was a concern that the Chinese parents have as well about how can you help us and then we had to think about the interpretation processes as well in that, process, in that support. We hear a lot about career preparation. Our students are feeling increased pressure around their career, not only in what they should be doing, what they should be studying and what career they want, but also in the amount of internships that they should be having um, during their college experience. Employers are expecting two plus meaningful experiences that help them with transferable skills by the time they graduate. So again, that's some added pressure for our students. But when we bring the intersection of the generational piece, that delayed adulting and student development and career development, we, we see that students are looking a little bit more right now to external influences, perhaps coming in like, I know exactly what I want to do, it has a lot to do with parent influence, um, what is the job market, what are kind of those, those um, external kind of prestige or, or income things that, that are enticing students to those careers. And we work with students to help them unpack that. Sometimes they come a little bit too decided and we want to have to help them support them in that process and unpack that and allow them to explore all the options that we have on campus. 
Um, we do that by starting early now. We are starting as freshmen are coming in, being introduced to career services. In the first year experience courses, they are both talking about the career opportunities. Um, and CFANS or faculty talk about that. We hear that in the, um, the career offices and visits to those areas early on. We're integrating, integrating the career conversations in advising, so students are hearing that right off the bat. Early contact with career counselors. Um, bringing them to career fairs early on, that sophomores go to career fairs to see what's available, to get ready to be able to see what the lay of the land is as they look for those future jobs, but also in preparation for internships. Um, we recently did a survey of students and found that students were looking, generationally looking at their peers as their number one career um, support. And so how do we then develop kind of that crowdsourced knowledge so that they can support each other in positive and meaningful ways? So we acknowledge there's a lot of pressure. We remind them that most of us didn't know what we were going to do when we were 18 years old. So we talk about um, chaos theory. We talk about the planned happenstance theories of career development and assure them that it'll work out, help relieve that anxiety. Because that career piece is also part of their worry and their anxieties that they experience. Um, and so switching majors and those things add that extra element that we want to make sure that they are thoughtful and intentional in the approach that they take, but they're actively seeking what those, what those answers are. And finally, we talked about the mental health services. You heard that just in the previous presentation, and certainly it's, it's, it's um, throughout the undergraduate experience. We see that students are, um, it was 47% of the students coming in and in, in orientation identified that they expected to be seeking out personal counseling while they're here at the university. And they not only expect that they're going to, or they're saying that they're going to do it, they're following through. So recently, I think you heard this earlier, but the um, Boynton Health Services saw a 63% increase in their service usage over the last five years, and 17% of that was just last year. So we see the increased need that students are coming here expecting the university is going to help them holistically with all aspects of their life, and that will help them be successful both in and outside of the classroom. Um, we not only have invested, and I think many of you are have part of that decision making to invest in our counselors, which is fabulous, and that has really helped lift, um, to support our students. But we also look at like how do we create that continuum of care? We don't always have to, we can get them earlier. And so um, efforts that we have mental health advocates where faculty and staff are trained to be the frontline resources within a, a department or a unit to help others in terms of responding. Um, we, you, you hear about the, um, the Let's Talk program, where we have staff trained as counselors that are sitting in Kaufman Union. They're in Appleby Hall. They're where students are. So it helps to eliminate the barriers of access or maybe some of the, um, the, the concern they have of reaching out to those services. We are embedding counselors in the colleges. CLA and CSOM have both moved into having embedded counselors so that it can be in tandem with academic advisors and so we can keep them on track while we're addressing whatever obstacle that they are facing. So mental health is a, all these topics could be full agenda items for you, but I certainly want to give you a snapshot of the ways that we are responding in the student success realm, how we're all kind of partnering together to support our students as we, as we hope that they're successful and we respond to their changing needs as generations. Well, thank you, Associate Vice President, or Vice Provost Maline, and thank you, Professor Mortimer. I appreciate the academic uh, perspective coupled with a, uh, a nice uh, you know, practical perspective in terms of how we're dealing with this. And I'm tempted at this moment to channel our former colleague, Regent Johnson, who usually <laughs> would provide us with generational observations, and I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to uh, go first to uh, student representative Schlieff, and uh, I think you had, uh, you had your hand up early on. Mm -hmm. um, Regent McMillan, uh, presenters and members of the board. So I think this is a really good opportunity. Uh, first off, thank you guys so much for this information. I think it's good for both myself, um, recognizing the differences in my generation, and also recognizing the generational differences between you guys and myself. Uh, so with that generation gap, um, and a very different world that um, I am growing up in and on the other student reps have been growing up in. We have more first generation college students, as you've heard, increasing diversity. Um, and I think this is a really good opportunity, especially for the new regents um, and, of course, the current regents um, as you guys continue to find ways to personally connect with students um, and individuals who are in this generational gap, the ones that we're talking about right now. Uh, Maybe that's through possible shadowing opportunities or like intentionally making um, conversation to learn about these students um, and their experiences and their current situations. Because that way you can uh, help 
better inform your decisions that you're making on the board, uh, but also recognize the impacts of the decisions that you're making here on the board. Uh, so like I said, I'm very, very glad for this presentation. I hope uh, that this conversation continues even um, after I am gone. Um, but I um, hope to at least inspire um, the incoming regents to keep that in the back of your mind um, and maybe push you to uh, make those conversations and reach out a little bit more to learn about my generation and the generations around me. So thank you. Very good. Thank you. So uh, we are... We are at time. I'm fine with continuing. I've got four regents here that would like to, uh, to ask questions and speak, but just recall I do need to bring us around to a consent agenda that requires committee action as well. So start with uh, Regent Simonson. Okay, real quick, thank you, Chair McMillan, and uh, thank you, presenters. I really, really appreciate what you presented. And as I look at the whole, we talk about mental health, and we talk about substance abuse and all that, and I really appreciate that whole package, I think, can deal with those issues very nicely. Real quick question, is this something we talked earlier about uh, the, uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, the joint effort on recruitment presented by the chancellors and Vice President uh, McMaster? Is this something that we could include in that package to show people how we support them? Or is it something we should? So Chair McMillan, McMillan, Regent, thank you for that question. Um, I think we do talk a lot about this when we, when we do our, with our admissions process. We talk a lot, and those are the questions that families and students are asking, is how will you support our student? And so we do try to bring up the, the array of support that we have as they experience the tour, as they hear about the, the programs. And certainly, so the admissions process, I think we are trying to bridge that gap um, and be able to fill in the pieces about how we holistically support our students. Was connected to the recruitment process as well, mm -hmm. not independent. I think in, in terms of as they come and hear more about the, the campus, yes, and they learn about our services, it certainly is part of the, we, we sell the whole package of the university campus experience and the support included, absolutely. Thank you, Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The millennials are still a mystery to me, so. Professor <laughs> <laughs> Mortimer. Yes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You know, for, for my new colleagues, this, mis this other mysterious term of reallocation, um, think about the $90 million that we have of reallocations that we've taken out of administration, and where have we put those? They've gone somewhere, right? Well, this is an area where they've gone. So our new sources of money are modest tuition increases and then reallocation. So if we believe in this type of service, that we're providing and it's expensive, we have to recognize that the source of that money is through reallocation. So it's not an empty gesture when we move, kind of shuffle the cards around the university. It's, it's, there's a net positive, it's not neutral in my opinion. This is a high value set of activities who, which are really helping students uh, on the ground and, and uh, Thank you for all your work. Thank you. Regent uh, Swigum. Uh, Mr. Chairman, respectfully, I will pass. That's right. All right, uh, Regent Paul. Thanks, uh, Chairman Millen. Very quickly, that was very interesting. Thank you. So your cartoon, uh, it's sort of that strikes the notion that some of this change is um, facilitated by tech technology. And I'm just wondering, Professor Mortimer, if you can comment maybe more on the, the impact or, or additional impact, if any, of technology, social media, all of these things that have, you know, that have changed the world so dramatically over the last 30 years since you began your study. Well, it's certainly been a, a, a sea change, and uh, it, it affects the uh, experience in the classroom. Uh, students are so drawn to these devices. Uh, faculty have had to... Uh, develop rules and uh, procedures, how much to let in, whether to use the technology, whether to prohibit it. Uh, and, and so it's a, a kind of a, a constant uh, issue. Uh, the the uh, students' capacity to access information and to, uh, to, to utilize it and interpret it, I think has, has increased greatly as a result of these uh, new um, methods and the, the search engines and, and all of these, these things. 
uh, and, and I've been very impressed by that uh, over, over the, the years. Uh, I, I think the students have uh, increased in their, um, you know, their, their verbal and their writing capacities uh, as, as a result of this sort of constant reading and writing. I mean, so, sometimes people complain that this is uh, something, you know, quite negative, uh, but I think that we should consider it as a tool that has both positive and negative uh, implications. And uh, I've already, we've already talked about, you know, how they're so connected to uh, one another, to uh, to their their families, and, and this is you know really something uh, quite different than in previous generations. Thank you. All right, last uh, regent uh, comment or question, Regent Anderson. I just had a, a brief statement because I was, I was confused. It was one of the slides, and it said something about this generation, and it said declining opportunities to work. And I I, I wonder is that this. The generation is declining opportunities to work, or is there a declining <laughs> job opportunity? Because I will tell you, if it is a, if it's that there's a declining job opportunities, I mean, for them, I think that's opposite of what we're finding here. We can't find students to fill positions, and up in my hometown, I was at the Dairy Queen the other night, at the Perkins restaurant the other day. Our summer workers are from Thailand and Jamaica, and uh, Austria. You were at Perkins; you probably saw that. Uh, so, are the students declining the chances to work, or okay. are there declining opportunities for them? Okay, what I was referring to is uh, declining opportunities for teenagers to work. So, not so much uh, the, the college students and you know young people uh, who have uh, completed their educations. And uh, if you take a, a long enough view back. Uh, you'll, you know, be able to conjure up the, um, you know, young people, teenagers who worked in uh, every gas station. They would be yep. pumping gas, and that's been eliminated. Uh, they used to be uh, paper boys that would throw the newspapers. You know, how many people even get uh, those newspapers? They uh, worked in retail trade, and that's a, another area that's been and, and declining. And, and so there are uh, a, a lot of teenage jobs that have virtually disappeared, and then there are more people who are competing for those jobs. So even in fast food restaurants, which you know are still a, a big employer of, of teenagers, uh, that there's more competition from older workers, from immigrants, and and, and so on. So that, that's what I was referring I to it, it, it's, by these I mean, declining from where opportunities. I come from, that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing we don't have enough workers. Okay. Well, well, well that's great to know that. There's an expansion there, or an opportunity for them in the future. I'd like to chime in a little if I could on this. Well, we, we are, for whatever reasons, we do see students coming to college with minimal work experience, different than what it was before. And so that's impact their career development, their understanding of what the career opportunities are, just their career knowledge. And so for whatever reasons those are, they're, they're working less. It could be the pressures of high school and the demands of what's expected of them during those high school years as well. Thank you. It's that 7th Congressional District, Tom. It's a hot <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, seriously, great uh, presentations. Thank you for being time sensitive. And uh, I'm going to now turn to the, uh, the consent report, item four on our, on our agenda. We have uh, academic program changes, tenure for outside hires, departmental name change, and a couple of uh, simple corrections to some title items from the last meeting that need to get corrected. Uh, Provost Hanson, anything you want to call up for our special attention there? Uh, Chair McMillan, in the interest of time, I won't uh, recapitulate some of those other things about the program changes. Just rest assured, we, the, the uh, curricula and the departments are, are sensitive to um, interests and changes in the field. But there is one very important matter in the um, personnel area. That tenured hire list includes the request for your approval of tenure for incoming President Gable. She'll hold a tenured full professor appointment without pay in the Humphrey School of Public Affairs, along with an affiliate appointment in the Carlson School of Management. Uh, the faculty uh, approved this and presented to you now for approval. All right, I would uh, entertain a motion to, to act on those, or if someone would like to pull anything out for independent action. Regent Shu. I have a question on that last time. All right. Uh, it doesn't need to be? I mean, I don't know if it does. Just, I want to ask. 
Do you want to ask uh, Provost Hansen and then see if, if that answers it? Sure. Um, I, I was a little bit surprised that... Uh, Grab your microphone there, Michael. Thank you. I'm, I'm a little... Some things I don't want recorded. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I was a little bit surprised that uh, her academic home is going to be in the Humphrey School as opposed to Law or Carlson. I do see an affiliated appointment in the Carlson School but I don't know what that means. So if you could just give us a little background as to how this worked out, that would be terrific. Provost Hanson. Uh, Chair McMillan and Regent Shu. Uh, uh, President-elect Gable has been working in administration for some period of time, and they, uh, the, the work that she has done previously as a, as a faculty member has been in some areas of administrative law. It was in a business school, not in a law school. There are, way, the, there are ways in which um, her current interests and the career development she's had fit very well into Humphrey. This was her decision to, to put it through there. As you know, people are tenured to the University of Minnesota, and they might be offering courses in a variety of places. She might offer courses were it to come to, to uh, offering courses if the president ever had any time um, in, in either place or in another place, but the, the tenure position only has to be in one place. Does that uh, answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you, um, Chair McMillan. I, I just wanted to make sure it was her decision, and I, didn't, I never saw this in her um, uh, employment agreement, so I'm just making sure. The employment agreement referenced the tenure, but not a specific home. Uh, uh, Provost Hansen. Uh, it, it definitely was her decision that that's where she wanted to place it, given the career trajectory that she's had. I might add that the, the dossiers that are um, prepared for people who are coming in on administrative appointments uh, you know, are, are in some sense full dossiers. They're a bit abbreviated, but she had um, outside uh, external referees who were coming from a variety of places, including business schools. So, which is where she had been before. So, um, it was a it was a very it was a terrific dossier, and again, the faculty are very happy that she's uh, joining them. We could ask President Kaler about the extra time available to teach coursework during a president's <laughs> Your very short answer, Regent McMillan. Yes. All right, I'd entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as a whole, or if there's still interest in separating it out, we can do it that way too. Second. Moved and seconded. All right. All in favor of the items in the consent agenda, signify so with a sign of aye. 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 Opposed? Very good, and I would gavel this meeting to a close, but I see stress fractures in the gavel from Regent Anderson today. <laughs> he hammered through 20 items, so uh, we'll softly gavel it to a close. Thank you. There we go. Yeah.